We are student-assisted medical and dental applications. A society at Barton the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. But you can call us Sanda. As a society, we are dedicated to support schools, colleges and sixth form students in their first step towards a career in medicine or dentistry. We conduct school visits to give you that personal guidance, clinicians evenings with prestige alumni and professionals, skills days to equip you with all the skills to ace the application, mock interviews with students and clinicians to give you that first hand experience and get you ahead of the game, a buddy scheme so that we at Samda can support you every single step of the way. Weekly tips on our social media to give you some bite-sized and concise wisdom and advice. If that's not all, our extensive Samda Medicine and Dentistry Guide and much, much more. Check out our social media and stay up to date. We are only a click away. We are student-assisted medical and dental applications, a society at Barton the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. But you can call us Sander. As a society, we are dedicated to support schools, colleges, and sixth form students in their first step towards a career in medicine or dentistry. We conduct school visits to give you that personal guidance, clinicians evenings with prestige alumni and professionals. Skills days to equip you with all the skills to ace the application. Mock interviews with students and clinicians to give you that first hand experience and get you ahead of the game. A buddy scheme so that we at Samda can support you every single step of the way. Weekly tips on our social media to give you some bite sized and concise wisdom and advice. If that's not all, our extensive Samda Medicine and Dentistry Guide and much, much more. Check out our social media and stay up to date. We are only a click away.
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Afia and I am a second year medical student. And I'm Madhura, I'm currently integrating global health. And we are Sanders co-presidents and will be your host for today's event. I would like to give a warm welcome to all the students who have joined us today from around the UK and also abroad. I really hope you are all well and staying safe. Welcome to our virtual medical and dental work experience. We have an exciting series of talks lined up that are going to be delivered by healthcare professionals, as well as virtual simulation activities. This event is open to everyone, so please do share the YouTube live stream link with anyone you think will benefit. Also, you will receive a certificate of attendance at the end of this event. You may have already watched the video earlier, which summarised the widening participation work Sander does. Afia will now go into more detail about who we are and what we do. SAMDA stands for Student Assisted Medical and Dental Applications. We are a widening participation volunteering group based at Barts and the London. As the name suggests, we support highly motivated sixth form students from local state schools towards a career in medicine or dentistry. As we're a widening participation group, we focus our efforts in helping students from underprivileged backgrounds in East London. These students may not have the same access to resources that help with personal statements, entrance exams, and or interviews, which are some examples of how we, as a volunteering group, step in to help level the playing field. Having said this, due to the pandemic, we have transferred all our activities online and our reach has massively increased and we now have an audience from all over the world. Shout out to students from Europe, UAE, and to those from the other side of the pond. I'll now hand it over to Madhura to talk about safeguarding proceed. Thank you, Afia. So, because we have under 18s in our audience, we are limiting interaction by turning off the YouTube comments and live chat. Having said this, you'll be able to interact and ask our speakers questions in the live Q&A by submitting questions on our Instagram story. I'll explain this more in the next slide. Of course, all participant information will remain confidential. However, when you do submit a question, make sure you don't put any personal information or use any inappropriate language. So that was some standard safeguarding measures. In terms of reporting inappropriate activity, please email us about this with your school teacher CC'd in. We will then escalate it as necessary. If you have any general questions that aren't specific to the Q&As, but instead are about SAMDA events or even about the application process, again, you can email us with the teacher copied in and we'll happily answer your questions. Right, so how can you ask questions? There will be two live Q&As one with the medical speakers and one with the dental speakers. In order to submit questions, you can um, head over to our Instagram. Our handle is at Barts underscore Sander. These questions can either be general or specific to a speaker. On our story, there are two posts, which you can see on the slide. And using that, you can type in your questions throughout the event. So here is the itinerary for today. As you can see, we have talks from various healthcare professionals, as well as two virtual simulation segments. Do take a picture of the itinerary. You can stay for the entire length of the live stream, or you can tune in for the talks that you're interested in. Having said this, we're sure that aspiring dentists would still benefit from listening to doctors in medicine and also from participating in the medical virtual simulation and vice versa. For the aspiring medics, you will find inspiration from the dental talk and the dental virtual simulation as well. And this could perhaps be a way for you to decide if you're unsure between the two subjects and also answer the very commonly asked interview question, why medicine or dentistry and not nursing or any other healthcare degree? So there's definitely gems in every talk, and we hope you're looking forward to listening to our speakers and jot down some words of wisdom. Before introducing our first speaker, we'd like to bring your attention to our book giveaway. If you haven't already done so, do enter the giveaway by following the instructions. This post can be found on our Instagram at Barts underscore Samda. So do give us a follow, like the post and tag three other people for a chance to win one of these amazing books. They will help you gain a meaningful insight into these professions, 
boost your personal statement and give brownie points in interviews. The giveaway will end tonight at 10 p.m. and we will announce the winners tomorrow morning on our Instagram stories, so do check that out. Okay, so that's the end of our general presentation. Do follow our Instagram so that you can submit questions for the Q&As, as well as stay up to date with our future events. Now, to kickstart the main event, we would like to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Robson. Alongside being SAMD's staff president, she is also the head of year one and year two of the MBBS program at Barts in London. Um, I want to welcome, there. hello, welcome. Um, and I want to welcome all the, uh, the students that have joined us today. Um, so I was given the task of giving a talk about work experience and what you can do to boost your uh, personal statement regarding work experience because it has changed what you can do and what we actually are looking for. So the medical school, when we're looking at the applicants, when they come in and we get thousands of applicants who are applying for medicine who put us down as one of their choices. So how can you maximize your work experience? And a lot of this is all about making the most of whatever opportunity you have. So if I just go to my slides and we go to, hopefully this is working. Yeah, okay. So work experience pre-COVID, um, you would probably write a letter or talk to your local GP as a potential way to sit in in the surgery and see what they were doing and talk to the receptionist and just get a feel for that side of the community part of medicine or dentistry. You could also write to a local hospital and ask if there was any opportunity to shadow the doctors or the multidisciplinary team in the hospital. And you might get to see what was happening in the hospital. You might even get to observe some surgery, but often you, you might just end up with a kind of uh, talking to patients, um, doing the odd job around the hospital, um, you might not actually get to see what the doctors were doing, but you'd certainly see what was happening in the hospital and all the other healthcare professionals were doing and contributing to the care of the patients. And you'd probably get to talk to patients. The majority of people, though, would often have um, volunteering in a care home, a local care home, a nursery or a hospice. And again, you'd, you'd, you'd go in, you'd talk to patients, you'd talk to the people living in the care home, um, and you'd get that experience of being able to talk to individuals and find out about themselves. And this was all the kind of standard things that we were looking for on your applicants. Um, then there was also, and this has always been the case, we've always looked for, if you've got a, a part-time job, if you work at the weekends in a shop or you work as a, a sort of waitress in a cafe or a restaurant, um, that is also still valid work experience. It's about teamwork, it's about communicating with the public, it's about being responsible and turning up for that job on time, um, week after week and time management skills, all of these are life skills. So we were also still looking for any sort of part-time job or um, other opportunity that you had, another volunteering that you had. What also contributed was also if you were a school prefect or a mentor for a, a group of students, if you were a tutor, uh, attendance at medical school conferences, a bit like today, um, that also counted. Of course, they were more in person and you might have got the opportunity to kind of have a bit of a simulation. We're going to do it virtually today, um, but it's not going to be as hands on. Or if you got to work in a laboratory or a pharmacy or some other um, work experience, all of this 
counted. And then we hit, of course, the pandemic and things have changed because basically the top three of what I've got there, in fact, probably the top four, no longer count. They're not possible. You don't have that opportunity to do that work experience in your local GP or in the hospital or even in visiting care homes and talking to patients. That has now all kind of gone. So what can you do that is still valid? What are we now looking for and what are we accepting as work experience? So think about what can you do? Can you volunteer for any local community, even just not even official ones? Is there someone in your street who can't get out, who is shielding or can't get out to the shops? Can you deliver their food or pick up their prescriptions from the pharmacy? All of these are still valid as work experience. So volunteering in the local community is now taking a much bigger part of what we're looking for on your personal statement. What have you done to go out and kind of support the local community? Even just talking to lonely patients or lonely individuals in your street who are living on their own and talking to them on the doorstep, that is still valid. It's about getting out and doing something, working in a local food bank. If your school's involved in, in that sort of activity, then get involved. I mean, what we've also had is people being a, a volunteering as uh, litter pickers and picking up the litter in the local park and making the environment a little bit better. That can still be done in a safe COVID way. So it's about thinking what you can do and what is still an opportunity for you to learn about teamwork, about communication skills, about time management and about giving up your time. So what still counts is if you are a school prefect or a mentor and attendance at events like today and as we open up the commute, open up from lockdown again, potential for working part-time in a shop or a cafe, but these are all still valid. But what is work experience for? And when it comes to your interviews, when you get called for interviews, what are we actually wanting you to get out of that work experience? And what we want is you'll be asked about the realities of medicine. What do you know about the career that you're going to go into. The same for dentists as well, it's the same. What do you know about the profession that has made you decide that this is the career for you? So it's about making the most of the opportunity. So if you do have questions for any of us, any of the speakers today, this is your opportunity to talk to medics, to nurses, to dentists, to find out what their life is like because it provides you with the opportunity to talk to medical professionals about their job and to get a more accurate picture of what the job actually entails. It's not the casualty or the ER or Grey's Anatomy that you've seen on TV. What is an actual a doctor's or a dentist's job day to day? What are the good things? What are the bad things? So what are the negative aspects of the job? And everybody puts down, well, the long working hours and the stress. I would say it's more the shift work. It's more the fact that your social life is not going to be nine to five work and then you can go home. You might be working the night shift. You'll be working at weekends. You'll be working over the holidays. That's more of a stress. It puts a stress on your home life. It puts a stress on your social life. What are the good things about the job? Um, you know, it, getting to meet patients, um, talking to people, interacting. It's not, uh, I mean, people keep saying, well, I want a job in science and that marries the two. It, it is a perfect mix of a bit of science and a bit of social interaction. There's nothing quite like it. Um, one of the other negative aspects that I should have mentioned is probably that it, it's something like um, almost like 80% of doctors at some point will be investigated by the GMC. So the medico-legal side of, of 
having that potential that you are going to be making important decisions in the care of patients that could have negative consequences and that other people might see that as too much stress and too much um, that they couldn't cope with it. But it's also about, as we've seen in the pandemic, it's working as part of a team and having that support around you. And the fact that the NHS has now, it's, it's a bit of an unwieldy animal as it is, but because it's so varied. But I think we will come to appreciate what the work of the NHS and all members of the NHS have been doing for us in the background and that maybe the public's view of the NHS has changed a little bit more for the positive and a little bit more um, sort of forgiving for some of our um, not so good aspects. But So what is work experience for? Remember it's also about the realities of medicine but it's also about what qualities or skills does a good does a medical professional or a dental professional need it is about communication skills talking not only to your colleagues but to patients and the way we interact with patients and with colleagues has changed we do a lot more online uh, a lot more via video conferencing and some of those subtle cues of body language and the way the person is sat or interacting is now lost. We can't make eye contact as much as we used to. So it's about communication skills and being aware of how medicine is changing. Dealing with conflict. Can you stay calm during stressful situations? being aware that there are going to be times when you're going to be busy, when you're going to be stressed, when you've got other events going on in your life, but you need to compartmentalize that and put it to one side so that you can do the best for your patients. It's about teamwork. It's about working not just as an individual. There will be a team of doctors, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, other doctors in other areas, specialities, who are all contributing to the care of this patient. The ability to adapt and learn, you will probably put down about lifelong learning. And it, it is that once you graduate from the medical school, your exams do not finish. They will continue. You'll have membership exams. You'll have various other exams that you will need to take. You need to have a portfolio that you maintain your continuing professional development throughout your career. It doesn't stop at graduation and you need to be aware of that. And part of what the medical school is doing is not just giving you the skills and the knowledge to be a doctor and to act as a doctor, but also the skills on how to manage your time, how to do that lifelong learning alongside doing a full-time job. My final slide is that, as we said, medicine is changing. It's not so much now that you've got the patient in the consulting room with you. It is about the fact that a lot of GPs are putting in a lot of investment into uh, video conferencing with their patients. And a lot of the initial triaging is done now online so that you can actually talk to the patient and you can make a decision as to whether they need to come in there is still that personal interaction, but even colleagues are talking to other colleagues online. So um, Newham, actually one of our partner hospitals has been at the forefront of this and they was doing it even before the pandemic and it's kind of grown, is that you can have a clinician in the hospital talking to other clinicians, not just in the next room, but also around the world. You could get specialists from everywhere to to contribute to the care of your patient and to talk have case conferences and i think this is also the way that medicine is adapting we've adapted to the pandemic and the way we are working is not going to be the same as it always has been it will change and will continue to change medicine is continually evolving and i think that is one of the great things and that's all I have to say. If you have questions, please 
do put them into the uh, Q&A session, which I will be attending later. Thank you. Thank you very much for that really insightful talk, Dr. Robson. I'm sure many of our students found it useful to know what counts as work experience during COVID in particular. My pleasure, as always. All right, now let's move on to our next speaker. We have Dr. Dipesh, who is a general practitioner and research fellow at Queen Mary University. Fantastic. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Good, fantastic. Right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, what I'm going to do is to let's have a look. Let me just find uh, my slides are gone <laughs> at the right time. <laughs> Give me a second. Where are we? Apologies, team. Uh, slight technical difficulties that I didn't anticipate. Uh, where is it? Here we are. Right, yo. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Yeah, that's fine. Chrome tab, perfect. Right, yo. So hopefully you can see this. Um, my name is Dipesh. I'm a GP. Um, I, re I do some research in cancer care at Queen Mary um, and also um, I'm very interested in health inequalities, which we will touch on very briefly in this presentation. Um, it's important to know where, where people come from when they do present to you and I want to be transparent to you. Um, I'm funded by the NHS for my clinical work. I'm funded by um, one of the biggest research funders in, in the UK for the research that I do. Some of the resources that I do promote, I'm actually featured on. It's obviously a conflicting interest there. So, I mean, it's difficult to really talk about uh, general practice because a lot of people don't really understand uh, what it is and what it entails. Um, and especially during the pandemic, I think a lot of people did think that GP practice practices had been closed but actually they had always been open um adapted but it wasn't it wasn't really featured in in many of many of the headlines and um, when the pandemic started and if we look on the media we number one would be very surprised if you can name all six people uh, i've i've featured this present in on this slide itself but the media present the media representations of what general practice is um are far are sometimes far from the truth um, and not really representative of really what happens and that's why I'm, I'm talking to you today so really just to talk I'll just identify these people before before um, um, before we move on so this is Carl Kennedy from Neighbours which is soap opera Australian soap opera this is Martin Clunes um, who plays uh, Doc Martin um, which is an ITV drama about a GP that moves to in the southwest of England as a retired surgeon. This is uh, Dr. Zhivago played, actually, yeah, Dr. Zhivago, um, which is a film representation of a book by Boris Pasternak. Um, he's a GP, um, is involved in the, becomes not directly involved in the Russian Revolution, but the story taking place during the Russian Revolution. Um, if we focus actually to real life, these three women, so this is Professor Trisha Greenhouse. She's one of, the, one of the most successful and most important um, general practitioners and researchers in primary care um, in the UK. She played a huge part in the pandemic to helping primary care adapt to remote cons consulting and the evidence behind masks in COVID, in the COVID spread of COVID, limiting the spread of COVID. So very, very important. This is Bola Owolaji. I think I'm going to say her name wrong. Um, she is the um, uh, Owalabi. Um, she is the um, head of NHS um, health inequalities. She's also a GP. And this is Nikki Kanani. She um, heads up um, um, the NHS primary care um, section 
She's also a GP. Um, so general practice is, is very diverse, but actually differs from what is in the media. So what do GPs do? Um, as um, Dr. Robson quite rightly identified, it's really difficult to get work experience. So what do we actually do? So it's partly in the name about general practice, um, but they are we are specialists in our own right, being able to manage lots of different conditions and different interactions of different conditions. So these are things such as um, uh, acute and life-threatening things that people might call in with. So for example, I might say, I've got chest pain or um, I lost vision in one eye and it came back, um, or I couldn't move my arm. Um, um, or these might be things on um, which need long-term care like diabetes or um, breathing problems that need um, review every so often to check that people can manage their symptoms and we are limiting the, the um, progression of that disease. Lots of different conditions. Um, we deal with often the different members of the same family so we get to know families of different ages um, and what we also look after the same groups of people to get to know people over a long period of time, which is really one of the privileges of being a, a GP. Um, and we often, it's not just based on a clinic setting, it's, it, it is community based, but often we are going out to see people who do need to be seen. So people who, who aren't unable to leave their house because of physical um, or, or or reasons to do with their mental health. So as well as the clinical side of the job, a lot of GPs, um, as most of the profession is um, getting used to, are involved um, with what we probably would say are um, non-clinical jobs. So as well as the day-to-day -day job of seeing patients, often they might be involved with other things such as making sure health services work in the local area, and they might be interested in specific areas of medicine, such as women's health or um, minor surgery. They're involved in research like myself, um, involved with um, prison, um, within the care of people who are, who are in prison, uh, teaching, journalism, technology, um, some work in the military and some travel the world through expedition medicine but that um maybe is a story for a different day so very lots of different things but it's not just limited i would say probably to um general practice but we are sort of changing the way that um that careers are shaped within um within pro within the profession the usual day is very varied um so classically is sets of clinics in the morning uh, around lunchtime and in the afternoon depending on where you work like i said before some of it is actually going out to see people in their homes because they can't actually come to the practice um, and make an assessment whether they need to be urgently seen or maybe just to see how they are generally um, there previously was a lot a lot more face-to-face -face work so people queuing um, to come and see us in clinic but actually what we're doing is we are it's we are getting people to call in if they need need our help um, or fill in a, um, an online form um, and then arrange for them to actually be seen. Um, a lot of it is is data running of of um, community care, which is signing prescriptions to make sure people actually get their prescriptions, making sure that pres prescriptions are right for the people. Um, they know it dangerous in, uh, interactions. Um, signing people off from work um, and making sure they're fit to work because physical and mental health conditions can affect your ability to work so often we are um, checking and making sure that um, people are right to work if they're not right to work then often we will sign them off i mean part of the job that i didn't anticipate potentially before i, I did embark on the career was actually writing to mps and writing um reports for um legal rep representation and these are things where people are literally being thrown out from the houses onto the street. And it, it's one of my duties is to write to the local MP and say, can you help out this person? They're really at a risk of, of, of losing their home or they're in deep need of financial help and I really need your help. Um, and often we will, we will get um, calls or, or from other members of the community. So paramedics who have actually seen someone um, that, 
they've been called to, that's it at our practice and say, um, we've seen this patient, they look okay to, to, um, to leave at home. We wondered whether you might be able to follow them up or what do you think about the situation? Do you think they should go to hospital? Are you worried, for example? So getting like a second opinion, or it might also be non-medical staff such as um, uh, physiotherapists and speech and language therapists, for example. And just, just like Dr. Robson said, so touching upon impact of COVID, so telephone first a lot of the time, um, all consultations that are done face-to-face -face are done in per personal protective equipment. Um, and actually delegating to other, other members of staff where they might not need someone who's actually medical. So it, it might be need, they need someone who's linked in with the community or may, maybe they need a volunteer to get their shopping for them. Um, and thus linking in uh, with them. Uh, as well as that, um, making use of, of technology nowadays, like a lot of people do have a smartphone, they don't all do. So that's why we must keep that channel open for people to actually come and see us if they need to see us. Um, but we can get people to text in photos um, or um, we can communicate them via text, like giving them inf information through online leaflets. Um, videos we are using occasionally, it can be useful. Um, but probably not as much as when the pandemic started. Um, yeah, this is about sort of mental health. So it is, I would say the job is incredibly rewarding. Um, and as, as Dr. Robson alluded to, the it, it can be quite challenging. So, so physically and mentally. So sometimes you're starting quite early in the morning, you're at work at eight and maybe finishing till and about six or seven or something like that. So that sort of nine to five isn't really what general practice is about, but it's really important that if you're not well for your patients, there's no way you can really take care of your patients if you're not taking care of yourself. So it's about putting your oxygen mask on yourself first and making sure that you're at your best capacity to be able to look after your patients. And that's really important that you should take through to all the way through your career because it's such an important point. Um, where is health? And so where, what is healthcare? So as a GP, you often see people with, um, with conditions which are in part caused by the circumstances in which they live, which aren't necessarily their fault. What, what do I mean by that? So for example, the shell stacker who has shoulder pain, um, because, because of their long working hours. And they're worried that if I sign them off, they might lose their job. Uh, sign them off from work, that is. So I write a note and then they don't work. So they're worried about that. Or for example, the, the person who, the, um, the refugee who's come to the, the country and they've got high blood pressure, but as soon as their asylum application is um, approved and their blood pressure comes back down to normal, um, and that's made me think a lot about what are the main things that affect health. So main things that affect health, four main things you need to remember. One of them is genes and biology, so the body that you're sort of born with. Second thing is um, health behaviours. So often people think about exercising, sleep, eating the right things, though not everyone has the same access to those things. The other thing is access to healthcare, so being able to see Someone not having to travel like 50 or 100 miles to go and have to see a healthcare professional or a doctor when you have symptoms that you're worried about. And lastly, the sort of bigger things. So things like um, ability to have a, um, a job that's, that can protect you from being exposed to COVID, for example, or um, ability to have a job where you're able to pay all your bills on time. And, um, and so ability to have access to a green space um, and the only thing you, housing that you can afford is far away from that green space so these are the things that really are where health is cre created and healthcare does have a role to help people improve the health but often a lot of things that actually cause people's health are outside their control these sort of social and economic factors and that's quite important to think about and that's an observation that I've sort of had learned about in medical school but actually seeing it for, um, day to day is quite um, insightful. Um, okay, 
So I think Dr. Robson did uh, talk about some of the things that can count um, to about work experience. So I'm going to go for, for a little bit about things that can help. So the Royal College of General Practitioners um, have quite a lot of videos about life as a GP. Um, what does that involve? Um, different things that are affecting the um, GP specifically, which you might find useful. Some of them are quite long and might be pitched at so sort of people who are doctors or have qualified GPs, but it might be worth you looking at that. Um, the two podcasts are actually, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the competing interest. I feature on both, um, but can give you an idea about some of the different careers that um, that you can have in, in, in general practice, but some of the challenges that people face day to day as well. So there's all sorts of like recordings from lots of different people who work as GPs, but also do other things, but their personal journeys, which you might find useful to get a big, bigger sort of grasp of what the job is. There is a, uh, a tool on the Royal College of GPs um, RCGP website called Observe GP, um, which is sort of an alternative to work experience, which I think launched before the pandemic. If I if I was if I'm if I'm correct, and um, is a free interactive video platform which you can sign up to. I think you need to be 16, um, but I think um, look on the website, have a look at it. There is also a link to other institutions which have sort of free sort of work experience platforms which you can do online. And I think one one of the things they want you to do is to have a look at the the videos and think about what it made you feel like and what you kind of learned from those interactions. Um, and that is really what what most medical applications are looking for. What did you learn from your work experience, and what what it how did it make you get a better better understanding about what the job is, and are you prepared to accept that um, once you become a medical student and you're a qualified doctor? I think that's me done really. Um, I haven't got anything else to say. Um, contact me, I'm happy to be contacted on different platforms. Um, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram is mainly where I live. Email and ask the people around you, ask ask the brilliant um, team at Samda about what the latest things are in, in work experience. If there's someone you can talk to and they're happy to facilitate that if you if, if you want one particular um help i'll be around for about an hour or so um and i'll try and answer any questions if you've got any specific questions um for me i'm going to stop sharing um right i think that's me done yeah absolutely just to echo what um dr dipesh just said feel free to email us any specific questions but of course we do have a live q a so if you have questions uh, specific to a speaker, just put it on our Instagram story and we will get to that. So thank you, Dr. Dipesh, for that insight into general practice and how it evolved during the pandemic. I think that's very important to understand. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right. So now we're going to have a presentation from Maria Hafern Benjamin, who will give us a closer look into primary care. Maria is a senior lecturer in medical education at Barts in the London, as well as a practice nurse. Hello, Hello. good morning. Good morning. Thanks, uh, uh, Mazara. Um, uh, welcome. I'm just going to share my screen as well. Thank you. Uh, welcome, yeah. students. I'm really pleased uh, that so many of you are here and interested in. Um, Yeah, interested in finding out more. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let me just share my screen once that's done. Because, um, of course, you don't all have to yeah, decide brilliant. right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit more relaxed now that, my, now that I know the slides are working. Um, good morning, students. Uh, welcome. Delighted that you're interested in applying to medicine and, uh, and or dentistry. And um, I hope some of you are considering coming to Barts in the London. Um, and I, what I'm going to be doing is talking to you a little bit about my role. So, um, as uh, Madhura has said, I'm um, a senior lecturer at Barts in the London. I'm primarily responsible for the first module that our medical students take, and we call that Fundamentals of Medicine. So if you are coming to us, you'll see a lot of me in the first term um, because that's one of the modules I run. And I'm also then responsible for the primary care placements that our medical students do from the very beginning of their time with us at Barts in the London. 
And uh, those primary care placements changed last year. And whereas normally our students would start working with a primary care team um, for within a, a couple of weeks uh, of arriving at medical school, you would go out to a GP practice. And so you would be seeing the healthcare team in action in person. Uh, last year, because of the pandemic, we had to make those placements virtual. Um, and our GPs have really risen to the occasion. And um, while it's not quite the same for you, it's actually physically going to a GP practice. Um, students have been able to meet real patients. They have um, interacted with GP tutors every uh, every other week as they normally do. Um, and for the next academic year, we're moving back towards um, what's more normal for us. So our second year students will be physically going back to their placements. The um, first year students will continue to be online for the next academic year because we know that there are going to be social distancing uh, restrictions, etc. in the um, in the autumn term as well. So um, uh, if you're coming to us, things will be a little bit different in September, but we're hoping by the following September when um, the COVID restrictions hopefully will have almost been completely lifted that we will be back to, um, to normal. So as Madhura has said, I'm, I'm also then a practice nurse. And um, for me, that brings, um, uh, it, it's very helpful for me to have those two different roles um, in, in delivering what it is that, that I do deliver within the medical school. Um, one of the great uh, privileges, as, as Dr. Gopal has said, is, is meeting real patients, hearing their stories. Um, I, it's always interesting. It's always fascinating to hear where people have come from, what, what their story is, what challenges they're dealing with. And that really helps to inform um, the cases we give to students to work with. It, it really helps to inform our teaching of communication skills as well. I'm doing it, I see these things. I learn lots from students um, in communication skills sessions. I take that back and I use it in my practice, but also then I bring things from my practice that I've learned or that I've worked out and, and I share that with students. And so hopefully um, we all benefit from it. So what I'm going to be doing this morning is following on from Dr. Gopal's talk, is talking a little bit more about the other healthcare professionals who also work in primary care. Um, I'm sure you're all clear. You, I, I imagine most of you have at some point in your lives been to a GP, you've been on well, and you've gone along to a GP surgery, perhaps with, with a parent. Um, uh, but there are a lot of other people as well as the GP who work within um, that primary care team. Um, so, so what is primary care? And I've taken this definition from the NHS website. Um, I'm sure, it, particularly if you've lived in the UK all of your lives, you'll be aware it is really the front door to the NHS. Most healthcare interactions start in primary care. Most people who've got a healthcare problem, unless there's something pretty severe and you know you need to go to the hospital, most people will start off in primary care. And as Dr. Gopal has said, GPs see undifferentiated patients. So whether you, you, you go along with you've got a sore leg. It, it, you know, that could be you've had a bit of a strain when you were playing football. Um, it could be that um, there's actually something quite seriously wrong in your leg. And sometimes um, it takes um, a number of visits. It takes a bit of time before it becomes apparent whether this is something that is going to settle down by itself, whether it's something that's going to be treated in primary care, either with some medication from the GP and or with some treatment from a physiotherapist in primary care, or whether actually maybe there's something rare and unusual going on and you're going to be need, need to be sent to the hospital. You're going to see, need to see an orthopedic surgeon, perhaps very, very rarely. Perhaps that's the first sign of some sort of very rare cancer. But when you first walk through the door to the GP surgery, the GP doesn't know that. Um, uh, and so it's using their skills to work out what it is that could be going on and then making an assessment as to whether they think there's, you know, there are there some red flags here. Is there something that tells me that this guy who's uh, come in, this 16 year old who's come in, um, is there something unusual about his story? Is there something that makes me a little bit more concerned about him? So it's a real skill being able to manage that situation and being able to, to decide who it is that needs further investigation and, and um, who it is that can be managed uh, with safely within primary care, where that, if that's the most appropriate place for them. And so primary care service is not, you know, general practice you, you will be familiar with, lots of other elements to primary care as well. And um, dental services, of course, are a key part of primary care. And that was one of the things we really noticed in the pandemic, where dentistry services were almost completely shut down um, initially because of the, uh, the, the risks, obviously, with 
opening people's mouths when there's a respiratory pandemic. Um, dental services were severely curtailed initially in, in the uh, pandemic and many of those problems uh, went to primary care and went to the community pharmacy as well, where people were going seeking help for pain, um, for swelling, for abscesses, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we really missed those services when, um, when they weren't running normally and unfortunately now they are back up and running again and uh, we're back to a more normal service. So again, you know, a crucial part of primary health care is people needing to be able to people being able to get help with their um, with their dental problems. The community pharmacists are absolutely invaluable. Um, there was an interesting article in uh, the Financial Times, which isn't a paper I normally read, but it was an interesting article set, uh, that was circulated on one of the um, uh, groups that I'm on recently, where a pharmacist was talking, uh, a pharmacist from, from Newham was talking about how, you know, at the height of the pandemic, he was seeing people coming in. These people were taxi drivers. These people were, were um, uh, working in local restaurants. They were coming into the pharmacy pharmacy he knew they had COVID they knew they had COVID they couldn't afford not to work and that's one of the reasons why the pandemic particularly affected um, East London where we have a lot of people who are living in multi-generational households we have a lot of people working uh, living sort of in, in very uh, close um, uh, proximity to other family members um, uh, or people who, who just you know were not going to get paid if they didn't go to work and so um, the pharmacies have been uh, an absolute cornerstone of the primary care um, uh, provision over the last, um, the, well, they've always been a cornerstone, but particularly over the last year, um, pharmacies have been open all the way through. People have been able to go into the pharmacy and ask for help. Um, whereas many of the other services, you weren't able to physically go into the building unless you had an appointment. And as Dr. Gopal has said, you know, the initial um, uh, screening of patients was over the phone. So you would talk to somebody over the phone and decide whether they needed to be seen, but anybody could walk through the door of the pharmacy and the pharmacists were there to provide them with some advice. I'm sure you're all aware that everybody in the UK is entitled to free health care. They should be registered with a GP. Now, there are obviously some groups of people for whom um, that registration with a GP is more challenging. Um, those people who don't have a fixed address, for example, it can be very difficult to register with a GP if you're not living in the area. And there are services now for people, for example, um, practices who work specifically with patients who are homeless, where people can just attend, where they don't have to have an address and they can attend primary care services. Um, there are other issues with, as, as um, Dr. Kopal mentioned, um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers as well. Um, sometimes they're in temporary accommodation. It can be difficult if you're moving from place to place um, to, to find a practice and to be able to be registered with them. But everybody is entitled um, to health care and um, they should be able to um, access it. Um, in the UK, primary care is, is organised in, in practices, in, and most of those practices now are, are larger organisations. So um, 50 years ago, it, the common thing, the normal thing was for a GP to work often from their own home. Um, a GP would set up in their own living room, for example, they'd convert the living room into a consulting room and they would, uh, would work from there. Over time, that has evolved. Um, it wasn't unusual for um, uh, nurses to start to work with the GP, sometimes the nurse was the, the doctor's wife, and, and um, you then had a, a team of people who were working together, then they would start to employ a receptionist as the practice grew, etc. Nowadays, those single-handed practices, as they were called, um, almost don't exist anymore, and most of them um, you have a group of GPs working together um, with a, a team of other healthcare professionals as well, and most practices in the UK serve a population of about 10,000 people, so they're quite big organisations. And there's quite a lot of um, uh, GPs are employers. Um, there's, a, there's a business. Uh, there, there's quite. A, it's, it's not just the delivery of healthcare. It's actually you know managing the employment of um, the receptionists and the nurses and, and the other members of the team who work with you. The statistic at the bottom is from a King's Fund report um, about 10 years ago, I think, where at that time, 90% of patient consultations happened in primary care. Um, and so as Dr. Robson said at the very beginning, it's not all about, you know, um, emergency uh, admissions. It's not all um, the, the high tech, high drama stuff that you see on TV. And that, that's all very exciting. And I'm sure that's um, made some of you interested. But actually, most healthcare is more routine than that. Um, and you know, perhaps a little bit more mundane than that. 90% um, of contacts happen in primary care, and but only about 8% of the NHS budget goes to primary care. Now, um, there's been huge changes in the last year, and I expect we will see further changes um, in terms of funding, etc., in, in the coming year. 
um, uh, as things settle down again post-pandemic. Um, and I'm sure public health are going to be getting more money than they previously have. They've often been seen as sort of, well, they are actually literally outside of the health service. They're, they're part of um, primary care. Uh, they're, sorry, they're part of um, social care health, um, rather than part of the NHS. Um, but we've seen that their um, uh, services have been absolutely crucial. The, the role of public health in, in dealing with the pandemic has been absolutely critical. So there will be, a, I'm sure there's a big shake up of the health service coming again. But that, that, that was the figures about 10 years ago, 90% of interactions and about 8% of the NHS budget. So who do you see when you go to primary care? Who, who are the people that you meet um, in the primary care team? So um, the first person you will encounter is the, uh, the, the receptionist or the patient advisor, um, as they're sometimes called now in, in some of the practices. And um, uh, they, they are absolutely invaluable. Um, and I'm going to talk to you in a few minutes about a, a, a composite patient, somebody who's typical of the sort of patients we sometimes see in uh, the practice that I work at. Um, uh, the receptionists often know these people and it's not uncommon at all for us to get um, a screen message from a receptionist saying Mrs so-and-so is in reception, she doesn't look very well, she's not behaving normally, there's something not right, um, somebody else has come in and he looks a bit short of breath, can somebody come and have a look at him? So from the minute you walk through the door, um, the, the healthcare team are, are working um, to, to it. To, to look after your health. The reception team then also deal with, they, they absolutely have to be mind readers. People will come in because they need a repeat prescription of the blue tablets. Do they have any idea of the name of them? No, no idea of the name. They've got an appointment with somebody somewhere. Can the GP receptionist help them? Um, you know, they, they've been, people have come, you know, coming in literally looking for directions, all sorts of things. They do a phenomenal job. Um, patients who don't, people who don't speak English. Um, we have some, some of our reception teams speak uh, other languages. Um, you know, it, it's a very difficult job um, uh, and, and they do it um, very, very well and sometimes get a bit of a bad reputation for being um, uh, gatekeepers. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's a difficult job that they have uh, to try and interpret what it is that people need. And obviously then a lot of it is people coming for routine appointments and that's all very easy to deal with. I've mentioned already that primary care is a business that, uh, you know, if, you've got, if you're looking after 10,000 patients and you're employing 20 people, um, then there's all of the things associated with being an employer. You have to manage payroll, that you have to manage um, uh, making sure everybody's taxes get paid, et cetera, et cetera. And so practice managers and administrators within the primary care team are usually not very visible um, to patients, but they will be behind the scenes making sure that if you've got a chronic health problem, that you go on to the chronic disease registers and that you get the follow up that you need um, on those chronic disease registers. They'll be monitoring to make sure that, that uh, we as healthcare professionals are keeping up with all of these patients and making sure we're meeting our targets. Um, our healthcare assistants, um, again, you know, we, we, we see a lot of patients with chronic health problems and the healthcare assistants have an absolutely vital role um, in working with those patients. And so if somebody, for example, has got diabetes, the healthcare assistant will do some of the checks, um, the GP will do some of the checks and the practice nurse or the, the nurse practitioner will do um, other, other elements of that checks. And again, you know, somebody will often get contacted by the healthcare assistants to say uh, Mr. Smith is, is in with them to have a routine blood test, but he's a bit breathless or he looks a bit pale or he seems a bit confused. Um, and they will then contact um, the GP or the nurse or somebody else you know, to come and have a look at the, the, the patient. So again, um, they, they do their own job, but they're also working as part of the team and will involve other people if they see something they don't like the look of. Our practice is quite progressive. We um, have a paramedic, we have a number of pharmacists who work in the practice, we have an occupational therapist in the practice. We don't as yet have a physiotherapist, um, but the um, uh, Dr Gopal has talked about the, the interactions he sometimes has with paramedics who've uh, been called out where an ambulance has been called to visit a patient and the paramedic will call them, um, call the GP to see is this normal for this patient, are they normally like this, do we need to take them into hospital? Um, uh, Emma, our paramedic, has, has worked in the ambulance service and now she's really, really useful um, in going out to visit people who are acutely unwell, particularly the older patients who have chronic health problems, because we're trying, particularly this year, trying really, really hard not to have to send people into hospital unless it's absolutely necessary. And so she's really good at assessing whether somebody is very sick. Um, is this somebody who, on top of everything else that's going on, has perhaps had a heart attack or is perhaps having a stroke or something and so does need to go into hospital? Or is this somebody that we can manage safely at home um, with some antibiotics, with other members of the healthcare team going in um, regularly and keeping an eye on them? Um, complexity is 
uh, it's something we work with all the time um, and many patients are on multiple drugs um, and our pharmacists are, are invaluable in, in, um, in helping us to untangle those and to, to make sure people aren't having side effects from the multiple different practice um, uh, medications that they're taking. We also have um, physician associates working in primary care now. Um, that's a, a new role, a different role in the NHS. Um, they're not doctors, they're not nurses. They sit sort of in between um, and they also see undifferentiated patients. And social prescribers are a new role um, and something that you may not be familiar with. Many of the patients that we see have complex problems, have long-term problems, and social prescribers are really useful in helping them to um, get integrated back into society again. So maybe helping them to access adult education, maybe helping them to access um, social groups, maybe helping them to, to develop IT skills um, in order to um, uh, to get better and to to be more um, uh, to. to be more fully involved in society again and I'm sure you're all familiar with you know what, what nurses do we do um, in primary care vaccinations um, um, chronic disease management uh, we see people with wounds um, we see um, uh, patients who, who need routine medication um, administering uh, etc I'm just going to speed up a little bit. I was going to talk to you a little bit about Brenda, who is typical of the sort of patient we sometimes see. Brenda had what could only be described as a very tough childhood um, and had um, uh, what we now call adverse childhood experiences. Um, her father was alcoholic and violent. Her mother had a nervous breakdown and was um, hospitalised for a significant part of uh, Brenda's teenage years. Um, uh, Brenda herself um, uh, had to leave school in order to look after her siblings. Um, all of these things have contributed to Brenda's subsequent health problems. And so she um, has had chronic mental health problems since she was in her 20s. Um, and there are a whole load of people who work to keep Brenda as well as possible in, um, in the community. And so I won't talk through all of these now, but you can see there are mental health um, uh, consultants, uh, mental health support worker, there's a community mental health nurse, the practice nurses administer her medication, the GP deals with um, uh, acute changes in her health, um, and the pharmacist, as we've said, um, uh, help to make sure that she's on the right medication. She's also got diabetes. Um, she's not worked since she um, had her breakdown. She had a breakdown in her 20s. Um, she's also got COPD. We'd really like her not to be smoking. But actually, in Brenda's case, if she does smoke five cigarettes a day, it stops her being so anxious and it enables her to leave the house and to do all of the things that we want her to be doing. So for us, with somebody like Brenda, smoking five cigarettes a day is the lesser of two evils. Yes, we prefer she wasn't doing it, but we will also need for her mental health, for her to be able to leave the house. We need her to be able to engage with people. Um, we need her to go out and to do things, to get some exercise, to meet some people. So sometimes decisions that are made um, are not exactly what the textbook would say is the right thing to do. People may be on a less perfect drug for them, but if that's something that they can tolerate and doesn't give them side effects, and it means that they actually will take it, that's a better choice for them than the perfect drug. We also do lots of health promotion in primary care, provide routine vaccinations, screen people um, uh, to make sure they're not developing cancers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So lots and lots of things happening in primary care. So my key takeaway message is um, healthcare is delivered by teams. You, whatever job you do, whether you're going to be a dentist or a doctor, you need to be aware of the roles of other members of the healthcare team because we're all working to get the best outcome for um, patients. And so even if you're not going to be doing those roles, you need to be aware of them so that you can involve the right people so that your patient gets the best outcome. And then, as I said, so thinking about Brenda as an example, patients are individuals with unique needs. Some people will have had very difficult lives. Um, uh, there are different things that different patients can, can do or not do. And so we try and provide the absolutely best care for everybody. Um, and sometimes we need to take individual needs into consideration when we are dealing with patients. So thank you very much for your time. And again, I'll be here for some questions later on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Maria, for introducing us to the importance of the multidisciplinary team. As you said, it helps provide that holistic care as you illustrated with your case study of Brenda. And um, as you said, if anyone has any specific questions, head over to our Instagram story. Thank you again, Maria. All right. Next up, we have our final medical speaker for this morning, Dr. Corkle, 
who is a first year specialty trainee in paediatrics. Hiya. I think you're muted. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to Samda for having me today. Um, I am post night shift. So it's going to be an authentic talk um, from a, a paediatric doctor. Um, so obviously, you guys have a, a few talks this morning. So kind of have this moment to have a little bit of a stretch, kind of get up because obviously um, there's a lot of speaking towards you. So, you know, have a little stretch and we'll get started. So, yes, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, so my name is um, Dr. Kokal and I'm a paediatric trainee. So I'm just going to go through kind of um, my kind of background and path to paediatrics. So I studied um, in Bedford um, and, in, and uh, got GCSEs and A-levels. So that's seven years of your life, you're trying to get these um, exams. And um, at this point, you know, when you get to sixth form, you're going to start thinking about applying for um, medical school. Um, so at this stage, I was thinking about medical school and I applied to various medical schools um, in and around the UK um, and um, I'm from near London so I, I, I applied for there but also applied for further out unis such as Liverpool. Um, after numerous interviews and a lot of stress on the hassle etc um, I ended up at the University of Liverpool which actually was the best decision I've ever made moving away from home living independently for six years doing um, you know and doing an additional degree an intercalated degree um, uh, was fantastic and something that I really enjoyed and would recommend students to do if they want to get that authentic university experience going somewhere um, further from home. So then you do that for six years. So it can be five to six years, depending on your path. And obviously, if you go for postgraduates and then after that, you do something known as your foundation years, which is known as F1 and F2. Um, so F1 and F2, you're basically um, the, um, the trainee doctors. Um, so you're just um, practicing your everything you've learned at medical school for the first time on various different placements that usually last um, uh about four months and you have three rotations um, per year. So at the end of F1 is when you get your full registration as a doctor, which is known as your GMC registration. Um, and um, F2, you're known as a senior house officer. So if you hear someone say SHO, that's someone known as a senior house officer. So I got to work at some fantastic hospitals in Northwest London. Um, and as you can see from this picture, I was shadowed by someone who's quite um, famous and in the public eye at the moment, um, a politician by the name of Matt Hancock. Um, so he shadowed me on my very first first ever night shift as a doctor, which was um, quite interesting. Um, and then now I am now in paediatrics. So this is a speciality um, training and, you know, quite popular amongst um, students when you're um, thinking about applying for medicine, uh, the thought of, you know, working with children in the future. So paediatrics is a run through program and you do placements in various different um, subspecialities. So these are other specialties within the speciality, uh, which can include things like neonates, uh, general paediatrics, A&E, intensive care and community. And this is going to be for seven years um, of training. And after that, you're a consultant and then you, you keep going. So at the moment, I'm at the right at the start. So ST1, uh, which stands for speciality trainee year one. So recently I created an Instagram page um, called The Peds Doc, where I talk about life as a paediatrician. I regularly post about paediatrics and um, do careers talks for medical students, uh, medical students, aspiring medics. So if that's of interest to you, please give that a follow on Instagram and TikTok. So now just something about why I chose medicine. And, you know, a lot of you are wondering, you know, you're at the stage where you're thinking about applying to medicine. So you need to look at various different things when you're um, considering career in medicine. And this is the things that are running through my head when I was at your stage. So medicine was something I thought was fast paced. You know, that's something I enjoyed, you know, working really quickly um, and having a wide variety of different things to do. You're helping vulnerable, vulnerable individuals. So this is something that's going to be part of part and parcel of your life. Um, and helping people was something that, you know, a lot of people say it's cliche thing. I like helping people when you apply for medicine. But it is it's honestly true. If you enjoy helping others and making a difference to someone's life, then medicine is definitely a career path that you should consider. You have a varied lifestyle. So no two days are the same. Every day is different. You're not really sure what's going to come through the door. You're going to see patients with all sorts of different conditions. And that's something that's really exciting. 
work security so when I was like considering with my other colleagues or you know when I was at, um, in sixth form applying to other um, university courses it was what work security was something that I was thinking about job security where you know in medicine you have this job for the rest of your life and you have that secure job and you are going to be paid um, better than the average which is something that's nice to know if you get into a career teaching you get so much opportunity to teach and um uh, impart your knowledge onto um so many people like we like all the doctors and the nurses and the health professionals today are doing organization so in medicine you need to be organized you need to be someone who can um uh, prioritize certain situations and if you feel like you're someone who's who enjoys organization or you know have a bit of that ocd element medicine is something you should consider Anatomy. So if you really enjoy biology at, um, in uh, A-level and you like learning about the human body and the anatomy, then medicine is definitely the career path that will be good for you because you can, you can combine that with your, um, your love for helping people. Providing support and guidance to your patients. Um, there's multiple research opportunities, like Dr. Gopal was saying, you know, he's a research doctor. You can do research within medicine itself. So if you are more interested in the science side, then there is that aspect of a medicine. But if you're more interested in the clinical aspect where you're working with patients face to face and you're doing that kind of job, then you can also do that. So you're not you're not you're not struck off to one specific um, path. You have the opportunity to lead, so there's leadership roles. And also in regards to Maria's talk about MDT, which is a multi multidisciplinary team, teamwork is such a massive part of your job. Uh, you're working with nurses, physios, um, occupation therapists, speech and language therapists, um, pharmacists, they're all working together in the hospital. Um, so that was something I wanted to do in the future. Communication, yes, you're communicating with people of all different ages. Um, and if you enjoy talking, talking to people, then medicine has that element to it. And finally, it's just very exciting and rewarding. As I was saying, no two days are the same. So you're not really sure what the next day is going to be. And that's quite, um, quite fun. So pediatrics. So I'm talking about the hospital side of uh, medicine. So you've heard about GPs, etc. So pediatrics is a medical specialty where you'll be based in hospital uh, uh, mainly. So this is the branch of medicine dealing with children um, ages ranging from zero all the way up to their 18th birthday. Um, so this is kind of, a you know, the nicest, funniest, um, funnest, most rewarding speciality is something that I um, consider. So you will see children like this. So you'll see a child day naught, so a newborn baby um, and even preterm babies, so babies that are born early um, and they can weigh, you know, the the weight of a can of Diet Coke, for example. And then you can go on to an, uh, a toddler. So you'll have see your one to two year olds, you know, smiley, happy. Then you go on to the ones who are now walking, getting a bit older, and then those in the school age. And then finally, you see the older children, uh, the adolescent children, um, um, age 16 to 18. So as you can see, in my job, it's a varied patient population. Um, of course, I'm dealing with children, but you're dealing with really, really small babies, all the way up to young adults. So that's, you know, something that's quite varied in a day to day life, which is quite nice. So why I chose paediatrics. So paediatrics is you're the one for all doctor. You get to do so much. Um, you get to communicate with GPs. You get to communicate with um, surgeons and other doctors within their hospital um, setting. Um, and you get to do quite a lot. So um, by that, I mean, you get to do procedures. So certain things like what anesthetics would do, um, like putting tubes in and um, putting central lines for um, IV access um, and certain things like that, you get to do in, in paediatrics. And you are the main specialty who does that um, in children of all different age groups, which is quite exciting. We're known to be the nicest team in the hospital, and I'm sure if you speak to any um, uh, hospital doctor or a GP, they will say that paediatrics are so accommodating and they're such a nice team. And when I was thinking about a career for the future, I wanted a team where it was going to be a nice atmosphere, a fun atmosphere, and that's when paediatrics really shone out to me. It's always fun, quote unquote. So yes, children do get on well, but majority of the time they do very, they do get better quickly as well. And children always make, you know, they always find a way to make your day, um, you know, better. And, um, you know, they can make a joke or they can say something that can make you laugh. And, you, you know, it's it, your day feels so much better. Um, it's constantly evolving. So there's so much research opportunities in paediatrics. As you can imagine, a lot of things aren't um, tested in children until a bit later, like medications and drugs, etc. So um, there's a constant 
um, research opportunity. Um, the next is there's so many different subspecialities. So these are things within pediatrics that you can then uh, become a specialist in, which I'll go into speak in, speaking in a bit. But there's so many different subspecialities. And this little meme that I saw, um, you know, this is kind of what happens. Uh, but most of the time, uh, the G poor GPs have to do this. where They're looking in the child's ear and they get this and the child's screaming. Right. So as I was saying, I've been going, I've been doing some videos on TikTok um, and about kind of my day in my life. Um, so I think this was kind of this would be quite useful for kind of the virtual uh, work experience to um, be kind of uh, experience um, life in my shoes for a day. So this is uh, a day on call. Um, so let me play that. Day on call. So yeah, so that's kind of what I did on day on call. So this is on neonatal job. So a neonatal job is where you're dealing with brand new babies, um, newborn babies, um, and you go to deliveries of newborn babies where you know, something uh, maybe, um, you know, they're, they're a bit worried about the child um, or there are some concerns, uh, the paediatrician needs to be there. So that's kind of, um, uh, that's a subspeciality within paediatrics itself. But as a trainee, you need to do jobs in neonatal because you need to be able to deal with those day naught babies all the way up to their 18th birthday. So just like I've just done and I've just come off, this is what a night on call is like. So obviously we do shift work in pedi pediatrics and other hospital specialities, which is different to GP. So you have to do on calls overnight. So this is what my night shift will be like. Night shift on call. Here we go again. Beep. And again. Spinny, spinny. Ooh, the brain. Calibration, intubation, and rest. Okay, I hope you guys enjoy, enjoy those videos. So that's kind of what we do uh, on a night shift. And all those things you saw there are procedures that pediatricians do um, on their own. So, you know, these things in the adult specialities, you have other speci specialists do it, such as anaesthetics, etc. But in pediatrics, uh, pediatricians do all of these things on their own, which is, you know, your skill set is very developed. So what is PEDS training like? So just to give you an idea of, so this kind of can translate to other hospital medical specialties, um, such as adult medicine. But for pediatrics, you, you can see, so this, as I was saying, speciality trainee. So you can go all the way from here, all the way up to ST7. So this is your training years. And then, as I was saying, you have something known as a senior house officer. So these are the doctors who are middle grades. So after they've done their foundation training, um, we are at this stage where we're still junior, but we're progressing to become becoming um, a registrar. So registrar, you probably heard the term, a registrar is a senior doctor um, who is um, in between the senior house officer and consultant grade. So they, the registrars make a lot of decisions um, on the shop floor in A&E or the ward. So in PEDS training, there's two pathways that you can take. Um, the reason, one of the, one of the big reasons why I chose pediatrics, you get to stay in the same area for um, your training. So I'm in London, um, so I get to stay in London for the whole seven years of my training um, up to, um, and even when I become consultant, um, I should hopefully get a job in um, the same area. So it gives you that job security. Um, so there's 70% can go into general pediatrics. So that's when you're a general pediatrician and you deal with a lot of things in hospital. And 30% can do a subspecialty. You know, as I was saying, you can specialise in a specific um, core subject within paediatrics. Um, so this is kind of our training pathway um, and subspeciality. So just to give you an idea, flavour of what these things are, you've probably seen these words before when you've gone into hospital or if you have a relative who goes to hospital regularly. So these kind of are the medical terms for different um, uh, organs of the body basically that are affected that, we're, that are, there are medics at. So respiratory is lungs, cardiology is heart, etc. So you have all these uh, subspecialities that you can um, specialise in in the future. And then you have a become general paediatrician. Then you have the acute and critical stuff. And this is the fun stuff, you know, neonatology, uh, paediatric intensive care, and then PEM, which stands for paediatric emergency medicine, which is um, what I'm interested in. 
Then you also have the community side in pediatrics where you can work in the community like GPs dealing with children with um, uh, autism or, or um, ADHD or learning difficulties. So these doctors within pediatrics, they kind of work a nine to five job and don't do on calls um, as you saw from the videos as much. And you can also go into mental health. So you probably heard of children and children and adolescents mental health services known as CAMS. Um, you can go through the pediatric route as well for that subspeciality. So the main pros of pediatrics, highly rewarding. There's nothing uh, more, you know, that gives you that nice warm feeling in, um, in, in, in your heart than, you know, families thanking you for um, looking after their children, making their children feel better. And, you know, obviously when the children are a bit older and they can talk to you and, you know, they tell you how grateful they are. It's, it's just it just melts your heart. And I, I love being a pediatrician. Um, as I said, generalist, you get to do so much on one day. Um, as I said, you can go from uh, a newborn baby all the way up to um, an older child who may who may be come in with some kind of asthma attack, for example, in A&E. So you get to switch between different age groups. Um, your skill set increases. So whatever you learn in medical school, it just progresses and progresses. Because in medical school, you learn lots of skills for adult population. And then when you become a doctor, you need to um, start implementing those skills. And then in pediatrics, you need to implement those skills in children of all different age groups, all different sizes, um, which is um, so you just develop your skills further and further. Friendly atmosphere, as I said, wide range of subspecialities, run through program. You'll hear this, some, you know, in your career, you know, when you get into uh, medicine or dentistry, run through program is where you start um, at um, your um, you, you go into the speciality and you stay in kind of the same area for the whole of your training which not all specialities have. So that's why pediatrics is unique in that sense. Um, and as always, if you're having a bad day, the children will always cheer you up like this little cutie there. <laughs> um, so the negatives. So obviously this is something that probably people are worried about. Children usually do very well, but some don't make it, unfortunately. And that can be emotional, but that's something that's going to happen in medicine as well. You know, just in medicine in general, you are going to see, you know, unfortunately people pass away. And that's something you need to start kind of um, thinking about now and whether, you know, you'll be able to deal with those situations. And um, I can tell you a lot of people at medical school, they feared this and they were worried about this. And I know lots of my friends who were worried about this once they become doctors. But the natural progression is that as you progress through your career, you you notice that this is kind of something that does happen and you learn to reflect on these situations and discuss these situations. And in medicine, as I said, it's a team. You have a big support network. So these things obviously will happen, but you have your seniors, you have your juniors, you have your other healthcare professionals like nurses and physios, etc., who you can talk to and discuss these situations with. So you never suffer alone with dealing with this emotional strain that medicine can have on you. So quickly about my road to medicine, just to so how you guys can boost your CV now. Um, so trying to get good grades, obviously it's not the be all end all if you, you don't but if you try and aim for the good grades then hopefully it makes life a bit easier for you for applying work experience as all of you wonderful people are doing today and you're here today um this is fundamental to helping you develop and understand whether this career is something that you want to do leadership roles so while you're at school try and get a leadership role like you know if you're a monitor sports captain house captain whatever your school may offer for leadership roles Extracurricular activities, we can't, you know, we can't tell you how important extracurricular activities are. Yes, you can love medicine. Yes, you can love science. Yes, you can love helping people. But if you don't have any other activities that show that you're able to um, uh, kind of have a life and have a life outside of medicine, um, then it's difficult to um, say whether you're going to be able to cope because having these stuff is what makes a lot of us doctors cope and get through um, difficult situations in our life. And you need to, medicine can be quite difficult, but, um, and, you know, you need to try and have something when you get home that you kind of, kind of keep that different, keep that separate, your extracurricular activities and your medical um, life. Care and voluntary work will always be um, useful. So working at a care home, obviously, if you work with children, if you do tutoring, etc., Reading. So like the fantastic giveaway this um, Samda's doing, the books that they're providing, these books are so good to try and get your understanding into what medicine is like. And This Is Going to Hurt is a book that came after I became a doctor, but it was it's, it shows you so many, so many anecdotes. It's so funny and it goes through the process of um, your life as a doctor. So I would highly recommend reading things like that, which give you a true understanding of medicine. 
So my final slide is just top tips for you guys. So organize, organization, find, you know, get everything sorted now. Uh, what I did when I was applying to medical school, got for spreadsheet, spreadsheets and work documents ready um, with what unis I wanted to apply to, what the offer grades were, what the ent entry requirements were, and just organizing your thoughts and having an idea of where you're going to apply. Be tactical about choosing universities. Don't just put all the um, universities that are really, really hard to get into. Try and put universities at different different areas um, and different um, levels of requirement for entry, just to give you more of a chance of getting into, med um, in, into medicine because it is a difficult place and a lot of people do apply. But if you are tactical in the way you do things and you or you're organized, you will get a place. Do your research and ensure you know those requirements for your chosen universities. Start compiling your CV early. So if you know, a lot of um, um, schools and um, six forms have um, teachers who can look through CVs, can um, help you with those things. So try and get that done early. Start practicing interviews. Um, there's, it's never too early to start practicing interviews and discussing why you want to do medicine, what you've shown to show your interest in medicine. Just talk to your colleague, talk to your friends, talk to your family about this, and that will prepare you for your interviews in the future. So that was a whistle stop tour of paediatrics and applying to medicine. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, obviously, we're going to have an open q and A, I I think, after this. Um, but if you do have any private questions or you want to ask me anything um, personally, then you can um, follow me on Instagram, DM me on Instagram. I'm happy to answer those for you. Thank you, Dr. Gorha, for sharing a really informative um, TikToks with us as well as um, telling us about your experiences. I'm sure our students really enjoyed that. Now we are moving into our first live Q&A with our medical speakers. Afi and I will be asking the questions that you've submitted into our Instagram story. Yep, and I think also Dr. Bacta. Yep, yeah, everyone is here. Brilliant. All right. Thank you, everyone. So we'll just start off with our first question, which is, how do you reflect on work experience? Do you want me to start General off one to anyone? that? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been, it's, it's the same for any experience which is it's about what did what did you want to get out of it what and thinking about what you saw what you did what affected you what what did you think was it and uh, not what you expected and and it, reflection is just is is actually thinking about what you did how you felt about that experience but having a kind of idea of what you wanted to get out, but saying and challenging yourself about, was it what you expected? Was there something unexpected that you didn't expect that you now appreciate that that individual did or that that was part of their job role? And I, and I think it's it's personal. You, you, you go in with your preconceived ideas about what you're going to see and what you're going to do. And then something may surprise you. And it's about thinking, why did it surprise you? Did you not think that that was part of the job role? And, and I think that's that's what you want to get out of it, is thinking, OK, that, that's actually given me some insight into what, what that job is about. Could I come in as well, please? I think sometimes students come thinking that we want them to have seen some really high tech, really complicated, really in amazing piece of medical care or something like that and they come and they talk about all sorts of you know weird and wonderful things they've done actually that that's you know what, what we want to see is that you thought about um what it would be really like to work as a doctor and yeah there will be some of that you know really dramatic stuff but 
um, you know, what was it that really surprised you? And it might be something really mundane and trivial, like, you know, the significance of, of somebody not being able to speak English and how difficult it is for, for them to navigate through the system. Something like that, that has a resonance for you, is much more meaningful than you describing something that anybody could have seen on TV, frankly. Um, you know, what was it like to be there in the situation and suddenly think, oh, God, that, that would be really difficult to deal with if I had to do that. I was going to say um, that it's it's all about it's about stories basically, um, and understanding what's happening between the, the the interactions that you've seen. So, what what is the patient thinking and um, going through at that point that's allowed them to reach that conversation with that healthcare professional that you've witnessed, or that interaction that you saw? Um, and it's the story to understand where people come from and their perspectives and the journeys they've gone through, which are really important. I mean, one of the things I think I, I do talk about a lot is, which um, I'm sure uh, Cockle will, will probably knows about as well, is is Paddington, Paddington the bear, right? So Paddington the bear, everyone thinks is about some fluffy bear that's come from Peru, right? Actually, the story is by Michael Bond is about is about um, uh, Caribbean immigration into uh west london um and you know, the racism that that they that that population did um experience and it's about those stories that people do we're not have doesn't have to be about discrimination but what they've encountered um going through in those interactions very good and just to add on to that as well if, if you don't mind me just kind of making a point a lot of people you know this is the question i get quite often like you know how do we reflect or what is good work experience and i'm sure leslie's touched up on that as well um it's you know sometimes seeing an operation a lot of people think oh if i got surgery seeing an, uh, a cardiothoracic surgery or a neuro um oncology kind of surgery would be amazing but a simple conversation a doctor has a simple conversation a gp may have with a patient who's quite tearful about a new diagnosis or something like that would give you way more to reflect on if you think about the the empathy that the gp used or the communication skills they used or the or you know the doctor patient relationship that will give you more to take away from that 10 minutes than standing in a surgery for two hours so it's not you know you can reflect on the simplest of tasks and i talked about this in my um in my interview courses as well but basically i went to a car wash recently and at the car wash i had the owner of the car wash he was kind of involved in washing the car as well and i only found out while he was cleaning the windows he said to me you know i actually i actually own this place and he was essentially gave me the best example of what a good leader is a good leader is someone who knows how to delegate yeah, he gets involved in the shared goal, which is to clean the cars to the best of their abilities. You don't always just see these work experience examples in hospital. You can see what good communication skills, good leadership skills are in other aspects of life as well. So this is part of reflection. Just think about things, think about them a bit deeper. And this is such an essential skill to have as a doctor or a dentist that you're going to have later on. And thank you so much. Um, we'll now move on to our next question. Um, everyone knows that medicine is very stressful. So how do you handle work-life balance? Dr. Kokul, do you want to go first? Yeah, so with work-life balance, I think obviously because my speciality is quite fun and we do a lot of fun stuff at, at work. So it's, you know, we do have these things, but it's kind of, um, as I was saying in my talk, you need to try and keep your work life separate to your home life. Um, sometimes, obviously, that's going to be quite difficult, but it's, it's you know, you need to, difficult things are going to happen at work and there's going to be certain situations that may linger in your mind or your psyche. But it's just trying to separate the two and going home and doing activities that you enjoy. So be it sport, music, if you enjoy singing, dancing, whatever you enjoy, just get doing those activities. And I think one of the big things that I um, think about when, you know, medicine being stressful is talking to your colleagues and your peers. Um, so your friends and communicating with them is always the best relief of if you're ever stressed about anything or if anything's kind of playing on your mind, talking to your colleagues is the best way of trying to relieve that kind of stress. I think this is again another question I get asked a lot because obviously doing two, essentially I see myself as two full-time roles um, as part of a junior doctor and as obviously the medical life as well and a lot of people ask me like how do you do it and in a way 
I think having something outside of medicine does also help you. It kind of helps you when you do, you know, when I am doing that stuff, when I'm, for example, I'm here today, even though it's my day off and I'm here and I'm sure with all the other guests as well, this is our time away from what we do day to day. And it allows you to kind of de-stress and think of something else and do something a bit different, motivate all of you guys and that kind of stuff. But for me, and again, everyone's different, have a hobby. I think it's so, so, so important when you guys get to uni, fresh as fair, go and find out all the different societies, join everything, but find one or two that work for you and stick to those, commit to them. Yes, it's gonna require time. Sometimes you feel lazy and you're like, you know what, I, I just wanna relax. But you know what, if you go out for a run, if you go out do that society, I guarantee you, you'll come back feeling better. And that's where it kind of ties in with the work-life balance. It helps you handle the stresses of being a doctor or a dentist way better if, had you then otherwise just slept for an hour instead, instead of doing that activity. So I think doing something else doing something and you know, like I said, have a good social network where you can talk about your issues, obviously maintaining confidentiality at all point, uh, but having someone to just kind of get things off your chest because a problem shared is a problem halved. Okay, great. So are we ready to move on to the next question? Okay, so we're talking about problems and I guess that nicely leads on to what are the most challenging aspects of working as a doctor? Related to that question, someone asked, um, what aspect of this job um, may the general population not know about working as a doctor? Because that's the purpose of work experience, to get that insight, that insider knowledge. I, I, I mean, I don't think the general I mean, there's an awful lot of paperwork um, which is involved, which I don't think maybe everybody's quite aware of. And you have to keep good records for patient records. And, and, and that is an important aspect so that you've got an accurate record. Because, because of the nature of shift work, you are going to be handing over to another team the patient's care so you have to make certain that all the notes are up to date so that when that new team come on you can hand over and, I, and I'm not certain that is maybe what the general population are quite aware of um, and and you've heard from um, our GP that about uh, getting to know the family and part of that is because you've got you see the same individual but when you've got over a thousand people in that practice, it, you need to have the kind of notes to kind of remind yourself of who that individual is and their past history and their, uh, and what you've done, given them previously, what you've talked to them about. So I think it, it is about that there is an awful lot of paperwork actually still involved with the job. That would That's what I would say is maybe what the general population don't consider. I was going to say a couple of things. Um, I think one on the micro and one on the macro. I think on the micro level, um, probably the thing I didn't really expect, um, especially with the stress of the pandemic, is the impact of of losing patients. Um, and I think a lot of, it's probably not something that the general population do understand, but I think there's something special that we're privileged to, knowing someone through their difficult times. Um, and then especially when you've, when your team have, have really tried tried your best and that how you haven't kept the patient alive and it's had a huge impact on their family it's just take a huge emotional toll especially during the pandemic as well like i think the itu doctors were really really finding it hard because they were having to they weren't allowed to allowed to have patient patient families in to say their goodbyes um and that was really really hard especially traumatic for those families as well because it was just on video which was a really heartbreaking thing i think the other thing i think as well as um is on on the bigger scale is about how healthcare is worked out for the population and how difficult it is to cover so many services and so many conditions with new treatments coming um because some things do seem like they would make sense, for example, looking for a specific disease in a specific population, but then sometimes that comes with huge risks, basically. So finding things that have got nothing to do with anything. So things that just exist in human beings and just disappear and have no real bearing on someone's health, or the fact that how do you make a decision for a medication that costs so and so million pounds for 
50 patients versus some other medication that could help 500,000 or 2 million or 10 million pay people could help them. So who, how do you make those difficult decisions? And those decisions are really hard. But I think maybe from the pandemic that people are realizing that these decisions are really hard, especially when they've been fast at, sped up in real time and um, every action makes a huge amount of difference. And I think just kind of adding on to that point as one, well, and, and, you know, that question in itself, the aspect of the job that general population may not be aware of or students may not be aware of. And I think it kind of leads us to talk about some of the negatives of the job. But I think one thing that, you know, just kind of going off from of what Dipesh, you've said as well, losing patience. I think that's also the point where the job becomes the biggest privilege as well, being involved with those families in their darkest and deepest moments. You know, when you're losing a loved one, that is essentially probably the worst day of someone's life. Um, and being involved in that, and just last Thursday I was on call, and as I was finishing, um, the nurse asked me to go and have a conversation with a patient who was actively dying. Um, and my entire 12 and, a half shi 12 and a half hour shift, those last 30 minutes were the highlight of my shift because it allowed me to go to this family who were com really anxious, they were worried, obviously one of the worst times of their life where their, where their mother was slowly dying because of a large stroke and just to be able to answer their questions their anxieties deal with all those issues explain what's happening explain what is going to happen those things just help kind of calm down the situation slightly of course at the end of the day it's still going to be completely horrible for them dealing with that situation but you were that person who was able to answer those questions for them you were that person who was able to make them feel a little bit better and i think that for me although one of the biggest negatives are that, of course, you lose your patience. But I think on the other side of that is you have the privilege of being involved with some of the most incredible moments in someone's lives um, and do a little bit to make them feel a bit better. And I think that's inc incredibly rewarding. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, I mean, sorry, your answers. Um, I have a question for um, Dr. Dipesh. Um, so how did you get involved in research? Right, difficult one. Um, nothing's ever straightforward. Um, I mean, truth, truth be told is that I wasn't, I've never been a massive fan of writing things. <laughs> That's from the start. I think even entering medicine, I thought I wasn't a massive fan of writing the essays and that sort of thing. But then I sort of did realize that having done uh, a degree within the medical degree, which we call intercalated um, degree, which is like a science degree, I realized, I think the impact that it could have. So I think a lot of people talk about clinical medicine effect can help the lives of, of um, uh, thousands of patients. And by teaching, you can change the lives of hundreds of thousands by helping impart knowledge to junior doctors and medical students but by research you change the way that we do clinical practice and you change the lives of millions of patients so that sort of really hit home into it how do i get involved um a lot of people say taking your chances and taking what's open to you so a lot of it was just asking people in my field um and about understanding what the job it entailed so because it was GP research. So I asked the people in, in the Department of General Practice at the medical school and I said, what is this job? <laughs> tell me from your, your training level, tell me from your lecturer level, tell me from your professor level, what is the job? Is it good? Is it bad? What do you like and what didn't you like about it? And then eventually I started to apply for things. I didn't get them. There's lots of sort of downsides, but what you do find is, um, when you start asking people about how do I how am I going to get into the next job, more opportunities involved. You just need to ask, basically. So I did more projects that allowed me to get onto more, uh, increase my chance of getting onto the next training pathway. Um, and then once people can see that you are almost not reliable, I don't think that's a very good word, but maybe that you can do research, you can analyze things, you can understand. Uh, research data and you're you're a good person to have on teams more and more opportunities start to open out um when they start open out more you get more opportunity into that into the research field i don't know if, if i've really answered that question it's a very waffly very fluffy answer to answer that question but hopefully 
you just got to take, take your chance. You've got to ask, and you've got to put the hard work in. I think. Okay, thank you. Um, this is more of a general question, but how do you narrow down and decide what specialty you want to pursue? Um, of course, we are an audience of aspiring medical uh, and dental students. So if we could tailor it to that demographic. If I may, should I start off with that just because I'm at the stage where essentially most of my colleagues are applying at the end of F2, we're all applying for different specialties. So personally, I'm not, I'm taking a year out, taking an F3 year. Um, the idea of that is you basically take a year out, you work on different things, you work in different fields. You can either work as a staff grade, which is you just pick one specialty to do for a year, or you can look them in different departments. Um, I'm doing that just to kind of do a bit of that and a bit of obviously continuing with the medical life. But um, essentially, how do you how do you pick the specialty? And that's a really difficult question. And also one of the most beautiful things about medicine, there is something for everyone. Right. And I think it first of all, it's completely OK to get even to the stage where I am and not know what you want to do. That's perfectly fine because medicine is so vast. And the whole idea of med school is it's designed for you to experience all the different specialties. Now, integrated degrees and mother, you're integrating, I know. And obviously now the, the, the FPO um, foundation program is no longer accepting points from that, okay, from a certain year onwards. I would still say, you know, intercalation is your opportunity to explore a field that you think you might want to do in the future. Um, going to the university that you went to, I went to Bart's, so for me, um, that was the home of the London Air Ambulance, and it's little things like that, you know, watching the helicopter fly over you grasped my attention. I was like, you know, this is something really, that's really cool. And then I started doing more experience into that. So my biggest tip to you would be, from the first day that you start medicine or dentistry, if something catches your eye, go and explore it, okay? Use those opportunities, join the societies, go to talks, there's extracurricular stuff. If you find a consultant that you think, you know what, this is someone I like, I, I want to be like them someday, start shadowing them. Be like, you know, I'm really inspired. Doctors love that, you know, and I'm sure all, everyone here, uh, or even dentists as well, you know, if it, it, because essentially at the end of the day, we, you know, we are also teachers and we want to take students with us and kind of give them the nice experience and that kind of stuff. So I think use the opportunities that you have with you through med school, dental school, explore those a bit further, and even at the end of the day, if you still don't know what you want to do, there's plenty of time and there is no rush. There is no rush whatsoever. I graduated two years ago and I've got 55 years ahead of me of doing this, which is going to be a long, long time. But this gives you chances to go explore different career options as well within medicine. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. I mean, I think even, I mean, you've heard already that even within specialities, there are sub specialities that you may have an idea of which area of medicine you want to go into. And that's absolutely fine. But actually, when you get into the years three and four, when you're out on the wards and in the hospitals and you see those different specialities in, in real life, you may change your mind completely. The F1, F2 allows you the opportunity to do little tasters in different areas. And again, you may change your mind. Even within, as you've just heard from Dr. Bakhtar, even when you've actually graduated, you can change You can change course and you can go in a different direction completely. And that is the beauty of medicine. Um, it's medicine or dentistry. But even within that, there is a variety of different things. I have a slide that I show on the induction day talk, which is in the BMJ, which is this algorithm which if you like the if you if you like the dark you go into radiology because you know that radiology department is in the basement and they they never see the light of day and you know if you if, if you are uh, don't like talking to patients you go into pathology and autopsy and and that's just a, a kind of little snapshot of you, there is so much variety that you don't need to make your decision straight away and you may fall into like I did into a completely different path from what I thought I was going to start off on. Um, I had a very clear idea I was going to do research and I've ended up teaching. I mean, now who, who knew that that was what I was going to do? I was going to be a researcher and go along the academic path and do all that and become a world leader in research. Ended up teaching year one and year two medical students. 
And I think thank God for that because Dr. Robson actually <laughs> taught me and that, you know what, first and second year, Dr. Robson taught me as well and I'm sure some of the other guys who went to parts. And I actually remember that exact slide you showed us, Dr. Robson. So yeah, yeah going back eight years now. So, and I think, sorry, Gopal, uh, Dr. Gopal took over from what you were going to say. No, it's fine. I mean, we don't need to overcomplicate it. I think, uh, I think, uh, Bagda, you said, um, you essentially said what, what Gary Vee has always said, like, Lob, young people don't know what to do with their, with their lives and uh, it's literally ice cream shop mentality let's just simplify it how do you know what ice cream flavor you like because you tried them all right <laughs> so you just need to try the specialties you just need to talk to people you know what's good things about the job what's a bad thing as well follow them exactly what you, you don't need to rush but you need to work out justify to yourself can i live with what this job is and provides and what, what it will look look like when i am at the peak of the career so when you're the consultant when you're the gp what will it look like could i live with that could i live with the training being x amount of years or two years or three years or you know eight years or whatever so it, you've you've got to sort of do the homework but just taste just that um thank you so much everyone um we're going to ask one last question and then uh, move on to Dr. Bacter's virtual simulation. Um, so what are the rewarding aspects of being a doctor? So I think Dr. Kokul, you mentioned some um, in your presentation. Um, so if you can start off and then we can go around. Sure, yeah, there's there's a multitude of things that um, are rewarding to being a doctor. Um, and as, as, as a lot of the uh, speakers today have alluded to, we, we're dealing with real lives on a day-to-day -day basis. These are real humans that we're dealing with. There's a lot of emotion involved, all sorts of emotions from anger to sadness to excitement. Um, so you, it, you're being that person who is there to support the families through whatever's going through, um, is really really rewarding and every day you go home feeling that you've made a change to someone's life um even the smallest thing can make a change to someone's life and i think as um Dipesh was saying you know every action has a reaction and as doctors that's all we do we kind of we you know we do blood tests because we want to find out what's going on we do imaging to see what's going on we talk to people and get the information from them known as a history because we want to know what's going on and everything that you do every interaction you have with a patient is going to um change their life one way or another um and as you know as a lot of the work we do in hospital and gp is providing support and guidance and educating um our patients educating them about conditions that they may be suffering with or conditions that their relatives may be suffering with and all of these things is ultimately a reward in itself thank you it would be really interesting if we could get um, your perspective, Maria, especially from the MDT point of view? It's, it's very similar, really. It, it is a privilege. I mean, it, for me now, I, I only work one session a week as a nurse because the rest of my time I work at the medical school. Uh, I wish actually I could have a better balance. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to be doing a bit more, have a bit more patient contact. But it's, you know, you meet people with some amazing stories. Um, uh, as uh, Dr. Gopal mentioned earlier, you see, you vaccinate babies, you see them on through the second pregnancy, you see the child grow up. Um, and, and having that continuity, you, you hear about their grandmother who's died. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a real privilege to just be part of people's lives. Um, and um, yeah, to, and to be part of a team, you know, to be contributing to that care. We're not, none of us are the only person who's caring for that patient at particular times. Any one member of the healthcare team can be critical. You know, it might be the healthcare assistant who makes a bit of a breakthrough and somebody starts to be able to talk to them. It might be the consultants. You know, any member can, can, can be a critical person at a point in the pathway, but we're all needed together um, for, the, for the benefit of the patient uh, as a whole. Okay, great. I think that's a really nice way to tie together this um, live Q&A. The main message is work as a team because that's how we help our patients. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their wonderful expertise and insights. We'll now move on to our next part. I think whilst we're handing over, it'd be a good opportunity to stretch, grab a glass of water or something. Okay, 
So, we are so excited to introduce Dr. Bacta, who is a junior doctor and also the founder of The Medic Life. He will now be running an interactive virtual simulation of an emergency case. I'm one of the doctors. Um, what Guys, do what do? I'll do. Um, okay, so we've got Sam. Right. If we, uh, Mother, can you share the presentation first, please? And just so I can kind of. Yeah, brilliant, perfect. Thank you very much. Right, guys, um, good morning, everyone. You guys, obviously, it's a bit weird to introducing myself after I've been speaking for the last 15 minutes. Um, but my name is Dr. Rakhtar Ahmed. A lot of you guys may know me as Back Here Living the Medic Life from Instagram. Um, I'm a junior doctor working in Hampshire, and I'm also the founder of The Medic Life, as Madhura very nicely introduced. First of all, a huge, huge, huge shout out to everyone involved with Samda, especially Afia and Madhura. And, and I know mubeen has been running the background stuff and just the whole Samda committee. You guys have done an absolutely incredible job putting this event together and I know we've got like something like 800 plus people watching this which is an amazing resource for all of you guys watching at home this is going to be something incredible for you to talk about in your personal statements and your work experience or in your interviews and also just going forward what do you want to do in terms of your life so a huge shout out to Samda for putting this event together now the talk I'm going to do shortly I've, I think I've only got about half an hour so I'm going to I'm, I am a bit um, cautious of time. I'm going to start my stopwatch as well just so I don't run over. Um, but essentially this is a presentation I ran a few weeks ago as part of the Medic Life Work Experience Workshop and we're going to take you guys through what happens at, when doctors, gene doctors are on call and we get asked to come and see an unwell patient and what actually happens with a cardiac arrest. Now you may have seen this before but this is slightly different because obviously I'm going to talk to you guys through some of the key things but also we're going to teach you guys how to reflect on certain situations. We asked, we talked about reflection earlier in terms of how do you actually reflect? Well, this is an opportunity for you guys to put that into practice. So this is an idea I had about a month ago when I was on call with one of the doctors. So let me just introduce you through the team who's on this page, on the screen right there. So on the left, you've got Maya, Dr. Maya Wahabe, who is a medical SHO. Then you've got Vikash, who is a medical F1 um, on the, playing their roles. And then you've got Emily Baldwin, who's another F2, and then me. So the, we had an idea about a month ago, roughly, Vic and I were on call and we actually got bleeped to go see an unwell patient and then who actually was in cardiac arrest. And I was thinking, well, when I was a med student, I never actually went to a cardiac arrest because they happen when you least expect them. You can't predict them. They happen out of the blue. Most of the time they happen when you're out of hours. So med students are not even there. Work experience students, probably you'll be like, it's very rare for you to come across that. So I thought, why not put this something together where you guys get to experience how doctors behave and nurses behave when something goes wrong. Essentially with a patient who is unwell or a patient who's gone into cardiac arrest, what do we actually do? The reason I've chosen cardiac arrest is because it's such an important topic. Within a short duration of time, within five to 10 minutes, you guys will get a chance to see so much. You'll get to see leadership, teamwork, communication skills. You'll see a bit of medicine as well. You'll get to see how the hospital works, some of the other things that happen behind the scenes, all of that in a quick, 20, 25 minute presentation. So that's what I wanted to do. Um, also at the same time, I just want to obviously talk to you guys a bit about a few more things that we're doing um, as part of the medic life. So Madhura and Afia have very kindly given me a half an hour slot. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk to you guys about the about the, the prize draw that we're doing. So first of all, I know Samda is doing their own, but I wanted to kind of give, my, uh, give something back as well. So a lot of you guys may already follow the medic life Instagram page. If you don't, well now is a chance to do that. So on Instagram at the medical, I think, I think the, the girls have got a banner as well. If you do, if you guys don't mind just putting that up as well at some point. Um, but yeah, so the medical life Instagram page, if you also go onto the website, the medicallife.com, you can sign up to the website. So all future events, you'll get emailed about those. And at some point during my talk, take a picture, put it on your Instagram and tag the medic life. And that will automatically enter you into the prize draw to win a free personal statement review. Once you do your personal statements this summer and yeah, so we'll, I'll review it for you guys. Um, so yeah, the winner will be announced this evening on the Instagram page. Okay, so that's that. Now let's go ahead and actually start what you guys are here for. So Madhura, if you don't mind, please now let's swap the share over to the video this time. Right, let's the best go. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna to talk to you guys through before, um, so essentially with this video, think of it as a junior doctor. Now I've just moved over from my medical job onto psychiatry. So I'm no longer in the hospital, I'm more in the community now. Um, it's a small psychiatric ward that I work in. Uh, it's seen as a community. But before, when I was a medical doctor, um, over the last four months, 
I would do on call shifts. So these would be either on a weekend, um, in the evenings, or even night shifts. And Vic and I, the reason this idea came about is because Vic and I were on an on call shift together. He was the F1, I was the SHO, and we had a reg. The three doctors were running the entire medical side of the hospital. We we're looking after 300 patients. And we got bleeped to go and, or Vic got bleeped to go and see this really unwell patient and who then later went into cardiac arrest, okay? And we're like, let's put this into something like a simulation scenario. So we asked the hospital, gave us permission to use their sim suite, and we ran this for you guys. So you can see what actually we do. So in this video, I'm gonna come and go. We're also gonna make this an interactive session, okay? Um, so Madhura as well, if you don't mind, uh, if you guys don't mind sharing the Mentimeter. So there we go. So guys, if you on your phones, I want you to watch this on your computers. So if you're not watching this on your computer now, um, go ahead and pull this up on your computer, the, the YouTube link, because that will leave your phones for you guys to use. So if you go on your phone, and I'll do this with you in real time, if you type in www.menti.com or mentimeter.com, right, um, that will take you to this screen. And at the top, you need to put in that code that is running at the bottom. So 9004-01126. Okay, so put in this code and hit vote. And that will come up with a series of questions that we're going to run through as we do the talk. Okay, so don't answer the first one. I think you can see it there. So this is what comes up basically. So don't answer the first one just yet. But essentially, we're going to make this an interactive session. We'll do little, I'll pause the video at various points and you guys can answer the questions and make this an interactive component. And I'll give you a bit of teaching with it too. Right, so I'm going to come and go. But obviously, with the video, we'll play it, we'll stop it at various points, and then we'll go from there, okay? So let's go ahead with the video. You guys should be able to hear that again. Okay. Um, what's been going on here? Hi, back. So we've got Sam. He's a 34-year-old gentleman yeah. that came in earlier this morning with um, cellulitis on his right leg. Okay. Um, they prescribed some antibiotics and we've just uh, hung those up. Right. Um, but he's, he's getting a bit unwell, so he's using an 8 now. His rests have gone up, his mm -hmm. sats have dropped slightly. Oh. Um, he's a bit more tachycardic and his blood pressure is a bit lower. Yeah, I can see. All right, so what has just happened there is that Vic, who's playing the role of a nurse in this scenario, so nurses would often bleep you. So we all carry a bleep, which goes off if someone's trying to get hold of you. I would pick up, I would call them, and they would say, well, we've got an unwell patient, can you come and see them, please? So Vic has given me a handover. So this is a 34-year-old patient called Sam who has started to deteriorate. And on the bottom right of your screen, you should be able to see uh, a monitor, okay? And the green number is the heart rate, the yellow number is the saturations, which is essentially how much oxygen is being carried around by your red blood cells percentage-wise. Um, and then the bottom left red number, you can't really see, it's a bit small, is the blood pressure, okay? Um, so Sam is, so basically Vic is saying that Sam has become tachycardic, so his heart rate's gone up, his sats have gone down, so his oxygen saturations have reduced, and his blood pressure has gone down, okay? So all of these things are components that are basically showing me that Sam is starting to deteriorate. So let's go ahead and see what happens next. I see his blood pressure is 88 over 50, so not great, um, and his saturations are quite low. Why don't we go ahead and pop, on, pop him on a non rebreathe mask, which sure. really does have oxygen. Sam, hello, my name is back, I'm one of the doctors. Just come to see how you're doing. Hello, doc. How are you feeling at the moment? Yeah, not too good. Okay, we're just gonna Okay, so at this stage, essentially, I have now seen the, I have seen the numbers, and my immediate concern, the th obviously, the numbers are off, so blood pressure is a bit low. Ideally, your blood pressure should be around 180, 120 over 80, roughly, for adults, okay? That's the general aspect. Sam's blood pressure is something like 88 over 50, so much lower. Your saturations should ideally be over 94%. Sam's were much lower than that around the mid 80s okay and again your heart rate should be somewhere between 50 and 90 sounds is a bit on the higher side so straight away i've asked vic to put on some oxygen now what would you do okay so this is where the question comes up so if, if you you might have to hit refresh on the mentimeter app but essentially um how would you assess an unwell patient and your options are read through all the notes first watch and wait a, B, C, D, E, so go approach the patient in an A, B, C, D, E manner, or call for senior support straight away. And I know there's about a 10 second lag, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys a chance to answer that. Um, so hit that button, submit it, and then we can see, and I've got, my, I've got my director of operations next to me as well, so we can see how you guys are doing. So most of you are now putting the answers in, and we've got about a two third, one third split between the first option, which is read through all the notes first, 
And then the, the more popular option where about 60% of you have answered do an A, B, C, D, E. So well done those of you who've said A, B, C, D, E approach, okay? Because you don't wanna, I, I mean, reading the notes would give you some aspect and, and understanding as to what's going on. But essentially with a patient who's deteriorated quite quickly, sometimes you may not have the time to go and read their notes, okay? So you wanna approach the patient, you wanna examine them, and then, and then obviously tie that with the notes that you have at your disposal and then put together a plan and that's essentially what you want to do because if you start reading the notes first you don't know you haven't even seen the patient yet they may be reading what they may even be in cardiac arrest already right but obviously in this case sam is already talking to me so at least we have some time right so let's play the video again give you some oxygen with this mask sam so just try and breathe through your mouth and then um, we'll help you with getting oxygen into your lungs i'm just going to go ahead and assess you all right i'm just going to remove your gown okay okay um Vic, what antibiotics are we giving um, so we gave him some fluoxetine. Okay, fine, and that's still running. I can yeah. see. Okie dokie. Um, I'm just going to have a listen to your chest, Sam. Okay, I can hear some just some some upper respiratory sounds. Um, fine. Um, Vic, let's try and get a cannula in his arm, please. Sure. Um, we'll give him five hundred million to start. Uh, over five to ten minutes actually, um, and let's get some blood and a gas as well if we can. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to pause it here. We haven't actually got to the next question just yet, but essentially what we're doing here, so the A, B, C, D, E approach essentially assesses your patient through five different components. So you've got airway, you know, that's, and it's done in the order of things that are going to kill you first. Okay, so airway is the most important thing. If, you, if you're choking because your airway is blocked, that's the first thing that's going to cause you to go into cardiac arrest. Okay, so I spoke to Sam and he spoke back to me. So his airway is patent. I then moved on to B, which is breathing. So I looked at his numbers, I started him on oxygen, I listened to his chest, and I said he's got some upper respiratory breath sounds, okay? So it's not like horribly crackly or dull or quiet. It's just a bit of, I can see that there's additional breath sounds. So he's working a bit hard, there's something going on. We're not quite sure what, yeah, okay? And then we moved on to C. So I um, assessed him in terms of his blood pressure, heart rate. It looks to me that he might be a little bit dry. Um, I've asked Vic Cash to put in a cannula so we can give him fluids. And I've also asked Vic to take some bloods and a gas. So a gas will give me a better idea in terms of his electrolytes and infection marks and things like that, and his hemoglobin. Um, so yeah, so let's carry on and see what happens next. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and check your kukuru refill time, Sam. So, and what I just did there is your check your capillary refill time. You guys can do this at home now, okay? So if you grab your finger and at your fingernail, if you squeeze it quite tightly for five seconds, so one, two, three, four, five. And just as you let go, look, it'll be white when you let go and look at how long it takes for it to become red again or pink again, okay? And that's your capillary refill time. And that gives you an idea of how well your body is circulating blood to your extremities. And it, and it kind of affects, it tells me how dry a patient is, if they're septic, possibly if their blood pressure is low, obviously we know blood pressure is low, but it kind of tells me of how much of that blood is actually reaching different parts of their body. So that's something, and ideally, your fingernail should go from white to pink in less than two seconds. So in this case with Sam, it was delayed. So again, it gives me an idea that Sam is not perfusing his organs as well as he should. All right, so let's carry on. It's a bit delayed as well, so he might be um, just a bit low on the foot, and maybe a bit of sepsis going on at the moment is what I'm thinking. Um, Sam, can you just go ahead and squeeze my fingers for me? Right, thank you very much, and his eyes are open, and um, Sam was talking to me earlier, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that's GCS15, and thank you for that cannula. Um, and have you any pain in your tummy at all? No. No? Okie dokie. Let's have a look at that cellulitic leg then on this side. Let's expose you fully. Let's have a look. Yeah, so there's obviously more area of cellulite is actually extending beyond um, what we had marked earlier. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look at Sam. So we're now done the A, B, C, D, E. So C was circulation. I checked that with the blood pressure, with the fluids, and also the complete refill time. D is disability or neurological disability. And you may have heard me talk about GCS. That's essentially a tool that we use to look at or to observe or assess a patient of how cognitively impaired they are. So it's checked over three different components. So if they're opening their eyes, and Sam is, if they're responding to my voice, which Sam was, he's answering my questions, and if he's able to obey commands. So he squeezed my fingers, obeyed my command, so he's got a full score, so I'm not worried at this stage about his neurological disability at any point, okay? And that 
is to do with like for example confusion or when it has different level it's a 15 point score and it kind of assesses at which point patients have started deteriorating when should they get intubated and that kind of stuff and then i exposed him completely for everything else which is e everything else and his main problem is the cellulitis now cellulitis is an infection of the skin it's where your skin goes a bit red and normally what we do and you may have heard me talk about it just now is it's extending extending beyond the marked area so the infection is spreading okay so that is something that you basically gives me an idea and when you see an unwell patient you have an idea in the back of your head of what could this be what is causing sam to deteriorate so i'm thinking at this stage looking at different factors assessed him that you know what sam might be going into sepsis which is where the infection spreads into your blood and start affecting multiple different organs and different parts of your body so let's go on and see what happens next um, so here we've got an allergy just to confirm sam are you allergic to anything at all yeah, uh, I think I'm allergic to penicillins. You're allergic Okay, so now we're coming on to the next question. So we're going to put the next question on your screen. So essentially, what we've done is I've checked on the notes at now that I've assessed the patient. And one of the things I picked up was Sam has got a significant allergy to penicillin. At the beginning, Vic told me that this patient has come in with flucloxacillin earlier that day. Sorry, come in with cellulitis earlier that day and was being given flucloxacillin. Now, flucloxacillin is an antibiotic that has penicillin in it. So Sam has been getting that. So what would you guys do at this stage? So go ahead and vote on your apps. What would you do at this stage? And you may have to hit the refresh button on the Mentimeter app uh, on the website. But yeah, so let's see what you guys think. Um, so I'll have a look at what your answers are at the same time. Okay, so well done. Pretty much most of you are saying stop the antibiotics and that's exactly what you want to do. All right, so you want to stop the antibiotics immediately because you don't want the patient having any more of the medication that is causing them to deteriorate the way he is. Um, and that also changes my thinking process because earlier I was thinking sepsis. Now all of a sudden I'm going to start thinking, is Sam going to have an anaphylactic reaction to the antibiotic? So let's see what happens next. Which penicillin are you? Yeah. Um, Vic, can we just stop the flu clock? Sure. Um, Sam, um, let me just, I can see a bit of a rash actually on your sides as well. Um, and I think that you've been having uh, penicillin in the medication that we've given you. Oh, crikey, doctor, I shouldn't. Um, yeah, so we're going to stop that. And I think we're going to just keep a close eye on you just to make sure you don't deteriorate any further. I'm uh, feeling quite hot. Yeah. So Sam is now starting to deteriorate. I'm already seeing systemic reaction to the antibiotic, which is, for example, he's got a rash on his trunk. Um, he says he's starting to feel quite hot. If you notice his voice changed slightly as well, so Sam is actually starting to deteriorate even more than he was before. So already at this stage, you're starting to get more and more worried. I've got Vic with me, so if something does happen, I've got Vic to basically ask for help. But at this point, if I did not have Vic, I would have shouted for help to say, guys, I need someone else here with me now. Um, let's yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, how is your tongue at the moment? Do you feel like it's a bit swollen? Sam? I can Sam, can you hear me all right? So Sam has now become unresponsive. Okay, I asked him a few times. He's not answering my questions anymore. So this is when the next question is coming up on your screens now. Um, so the question is, what, what do you do when a patient becomes unresponsive? Okay, you've got four options. So you've got start CPR straight away, call the cardiac arrest team, do nothing, or look, listen, and feel. So I'm going to give you guys about five, 10 seconds just to answer that. And at this point, Obviously, Sam has become unresponsive. This has now become a medical emergency. Okay, um, so what would you guys think? And let's have a look at the third screen to see what you guys are answering. So we've got a bit of a mix between start CPR and we've got a bit of a mix between look, listen and feel. So about half of you are saying look, listen and feel. About a third of you are saying um, start CPR straight away. Now, for those of you who are saying start CPR straight away, the issue with that is we don't know yet if Sam has actually deteriorated and this, his heart has stopped, if he's gone into cardiac arrest. So starting CPR is not appropriate at this stage because you need to first assess and find out if CPR is even appropriate, which is where the look, listen and feel comes in. So well done those of you who said look, listen and feel. And ideally, if you look at me in that position right there, that's me doing look, listen and feel. So you're looking for the chest rise, you're looking for as a patient breathes, um, if his chest is going up and down, you're listening for his breath sounds. Obviously, you've got the oxygen in place there, but you know, ideally, you want to move the oxygen out of the way so you can hear them breathe. And you're feeling for their carotid pulse. So if you guys take two fingers, put them at the side of your neck here, you should be able to feel your own pulse. Okay, so I'm feeling for the pulse, but I'm also feeling for Sam's breath to touch my face. Um, and that is look, listen, feel. You do that ideally for 10 seconds. 
and then you if the patient is completely unresponsive, you start CPR. Okay, so for all of those of you who said, look, listen and feel. Right, Vic, he's unresponsive. So can we please put our double two, double two call sure. um, and ask for our adult cardiac arrest team to come over to this board, please. Uh, can I put our cardiac arrest call for an adult in uh, AMU? Uh, Hi, Hi. Hi. Hi, my name's back. Are you able to take over from the our country? Okay. So five, four, three, two. All right, well, now we've gone into cardiac arrest. CPR has begun, okay? We have got the, met the whole on-call team has now come because you call double two double two, which most hospitals is a switchboard. You say very clearly, I want to put out cardiac arrest call in the AMU, um, it's an adult patient, okay? So they will then bleep everyone who's involved and this is where the medical team will come, the medical F1, medical secure, medical registrar, porters will come in case you need to run things around or if you, in case you need to get blood and things like that. The ICU team will be made aware. So basically everyone just swarms to this place and you have a, a lot of pairs of hands to take over. Now, what I want you guys to do is over the next few minutes, we've got about three minutes of this video left with pausing and things, so it will actually be another 10 minutes or so of presentation, but I want you to focus on the little things that are happening. Now, for example, me counting down the last five of the cardio, like five, four, three, two, one, and then Emily takes over. There should be no gap whatsoever. So just look at the different levels of communication that are going around here, and this is where reflection comes in. Okay, this is where you see something, you think about how was that made so efficient? Why was it made so efficient? You know, look for the teamwork and communication skills that are taking place in the next few minutes. One, okay. Um, can we just get the pads? I'm just gonna go in and pack the pads around you. Okay. Sorry, Megan's gonna get past you. Thank you. Hi there. Hi, Maya. My name's back. I'm one of the medical um, SHOs. Hello. So we've got we've got Sam here, he's a thirty four year old chap um, yeah. who's come in with cellulitis. So I'm just gonna set off the next question now as well. So what is the ratio of compressions to breaths? for adult? Is it one compression to two breaths? Is it 10 compressions to two breaths? 15 compressions to two breaths? Or 30 compressions to two breaths? Okay, so go ahead and answer that whilst I talk you through what's now happening. So now we've got Vic who's on the airway, we've got Emily doing the compressions, we've got Maya who's just adjusting the pads but she's going to go ahead and take, in, take control of the defibrillator which is a crash trolley just behind and I've come to the end of the bed and my role is the team leader which oversees, who oversees everything that's going on, gives clear communication um, orders or advice, okay, so you'll see every time I talk I will use the person's names first because human factors play a huge role. This is essentially, human factors is such an interesting topic. Have you ever been in a situation where you're talking to your friend, but because they're texting, they can't hear you? Or the same thing may have happened to you. I bet you have. This is called bandwidth. This is where, when you're so focused on a task, you can't understand or hear what else is going on. And this is something that, because of the stress, because of cardiac arrest, those things happen. So clear communication is so important. So every time I talk to someone, every time I tell someone to do something, you'll hear me say their name first. And this is an example of good communication skills, right? And again, teamwork and leadership is also gonna be seen here. So let's um, go ahead and let's see what you guys have answered. So most of you, so again, we've got a bit of a split between 10 to two and 30 to two. Now the actual ratio for adults is 30 compressions to two breaths and different ages have different ratios but essentially you want to do compressions which artificially pump the blood around your body and then the breaths help oxygenate, oxygenate the lungs. Giving fluproxacillin and an allergic to penicillin. Yeah. Um, so we've just got compressions going on now. Yeah. Fine. Um, can I ask you to just get the defib pads and let's look yeah. at, let's um, get the rhythm to switch Okay, guys, we're going to do a rhythm check shortly. Uh, so, Emily, can you stop the compressions, please? Let's have a look at the rhythm. Um, that's via back on the chest, please. So, we're just going to do 32. Right, so that really quick moment, a lot of things happened there. Okay, so we asked Emily, can you stop? Emily stopped compressions. Maya at the back had already connected the pads, she started the defibrillator, we did a rhythm check. Now essentially what that means is we're looking at what the heart is doing. The pads on the chest are picking up the electrical conduct, um, conduction from the heart. Now ideally what you want is your atria to contract and your ventricles to contract and that's what your heart should be doing. That green line at the top of the monitor is really squiggly, it's not rhythmical, which means the heart is just fluttering and that's called ventricular fibrillation. Don't worry about writing that down, this is not an exam. I want you to guys just absorb this stuff in, all right? And, and just look for all the different things that are happening. So ventricular fibrillation ideally means that the heart is not creating or generating an output of blood to the body because it's just fluttering. So you wanna shock it 
restart here so it starts becoming nice and rhythmical. So that's what we're going to do. So we've identified that's a shockable rhythm and we're now going to go ahead and deliver a shock soon. Two, and can you guys swap so Anthony doesn't get tired sure. and whenever yeah. you're ready? Okay. Um, and Another thing I want you to look out for is as I'm giving the different roles and assigns to giving people different tasks to do, watch how Emily and Vic are also communicating amongst themselves, okay? Because they are essentially, um, CPR compressions are very tiring, okay? So Emily will essentially, no, no matter who you are, you will get tired and then you will not be providing optimized compressions. So you, ideally you want to swap between people, okay? So you will see Emily and Vic talking amongst themselves and deciding when they're going to do that. I'm going to hand it over to you, Maya, for the default. Um, it's a shock of a rhythm, so we'll go ahead with the first shock. Sure. Okay. I'm going to charge everybody except compressions away. Charging. Compressions away. Mm -hmm. Shock. Shocking everyone back on the chest, please. Right, um, great stuff. So that's the first shock done. So guys, um, I think he was having anaphylaxis. So what we'll do is we'll modify the algorithm slightly. Right, so we've given the first shock to the patient. Okay, we've started the compressions again. Ideally, you want to delay, you want to reduce any delays. You want to do things really snappy to make sure that we don't lose any time because for every second that the blood is not being pumped around to the brain, you are affecting the patient massively and the outcome. Okay, so everything has to be on point and it has to run super smoothly. So we've given the first shock. Also, you may have seen the slickest change between Emily and Vic. Now Vic is on the chest, right? You guys may have not even seen that, maybe. But Vic is now on the chest. They've swapped already because they already spoke about when they were going to swap, right? And that is communication skills. That is teamwork. So reflect on this. Talk about it in your interviews and in your personal statements as well if you want. And now, now what you're going to see me do is I'm going to work through the four H's and the four T's. You guys can look that up in your own time, but essentially these are reversible causes of cardiac arrest, okay? How can we get Sam back? How can we do things to reverse whatever caused him to go into cardiac arrest? Um, we have identified that he had an anaphylactic shock, okay? Um, so we can give him some adrenaline, and that's what we're going to do next soon. Let's go ahead and give him um, IV, sorry, I am 1 in 1,000 adrenaline, um, half a milligram. Okay. Um, and so I'm just going to also work through the four H's and the four T's. Um, thinking about hypoxia, he felt warm to me when I was assessing him, so I don't think this is hypothermia. Um, I've got the results for the gas on the computer system, um, and he wasn't having any electrolyte imbalances, um, so I'm not too worried about any hypo or hypokalemia. Okay. Um, so in terms of, can I ask you, Maya, just to keep an eye on the timer, oh, so when yeah. we're 20 seconds away from two minutes, just let me know. Sure. Um, also thinking about whether there might be a um, hypoxia, again, he was saturating over root and going on the 15 liters of oxygen. Um, and hypovolemia, his blood pressure was low, but we've given him a stat. Um, okay, so thank you for the attention here with us. Emily, when you get a second, mm -hmm. um, can we give a listen to the chest, please? I'll give you a stir. Um, and we'll have a listen just to see if there's a tension in the thoracic. Let me do that while the spirit's here. Yeah. So we've got about 50 seconds left. Okie dokie. Um, so if there's no pneumothorax, uh, the trachea central, we're yeah. happy that's not a tension in the Awesome. And I don't think you could be tampered as a young patient with no, no. previous cardiac history um, and unlikely to be thrombus. We will do a proper ECG if we go into ROS. Um, and finally, how are we doing for time? Yeah, I'm, uh, we're almost there. So okay, I'm going to okay. charge again. Right, guys. Um, so, Maya, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, so um, everybody but compressions away, charging. Okay, compressions away. Okay, so what just happened there is we've talked through the four H's and four T's. We've talked through different things that may cause a patient to go into cardiac arrest. We couldn't really identify a cause except from the anaphylactic shock. So we've treated him with adrenaline. Also, at this stage, the communication, I hand over leadership to Maya when she's about to shock the patient. Now, shocking someone is an incredibly dangerous procedure because if Emily or Vic are on the chest, they're touching the patient whilst we shock, they will get shocked as well. Okay, that's going to be a huge problem. If the oxygen is on the patient, that oxygen could explode, all right? So again, massive, massive danger. If I'm touching the bed, the bed is made of metal, I would get shocked too. So Maya has a responsibility, and you may have heard her say, everyone accept compressions away, which means you still keep the compressions going. So uh, Emily moved away with the oxygen, she's keeping the oxygen away, you can see. I moved back, Vic 
kept on going with the compressions. Then once she charged, she said, okay, compressions away. So everyone is away now. She then looks, look at her looking before she shocks. She's looking to check that no one is close to the bed. And then she shocks the patient. And then we get back on it. And you're about to see another slick handover between the two guys, um, Vic and Emily. Shock. And everyone back on the chest, please. Right, guys. Right. Um, another thing we're just going to do now is the question is the fifth question is coming up now So we left something out on purpose because we wanted to see how many of you were paying attention Okay, so the next question you may have to refresh your mentimeter thing, but have a look at the question What did we miss out? Okay on purpose to kind of see if you guys are aware you may not be but hey ho um, So the first thing is um, what did we leave out? We should call for more help We should have done a rhythm check before shocking We should have put the patient into a recovery position or we should have given him some other antibiotics. What do you guys think? I'll give you guys about 10 seconds to answer that question. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and play. Um, so let's see what you guys are saying at the moment. So most of you are saying, oh, you know, about 80% of you saying a rhythm check and that's exactly what we should have done, okay? Because we gave a shock earlier, we should have done a second rhythm check because that's what you wanna do next to see, has this patient got circulation again? Um, rhythm checks are quite quick before we start shocking again and then going back into CPR. So that's something that you want to do. Okay, so we've now done the shock and we're going to continue. Let's go ahead and give um, one in 10,000 uh, IV adrenaline for the cardiac arrest please. please. Um, so, my can you get that? And then once the adrenaline is gone, we'll do another rhythm check shortly. Um, so guys, I think the main cause in this case here is going to be uh, anaphylactic shock. I think that's what's going on. We've given um, the first dose of adrenaline. We also give the IM adrenaline as well. The patient is on um, 15 liters, and we're about to do a definitive airway as well shortly. Guys, after this cycle of CPR, we'll do a rhythm check um, just to see what's going on with the rhythm. Um, Vic, whilst we're doing the rhythm check, please, can you also listen for the pulse? Yep. Um, and then Emily, let's try and minimize uh, the delay between the CPIs yeah, as well as the Okay, so let's Emily, do a rhythm check. So this is where we now stopped compressions very quickly. We're doing a rhythm check and that's the green squiggly line. And this is where things worked so beautifully. In real time, you're about to see the green line um, the right side, so basically the, 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 the monitor um, replaces the, the rhythm every 10 seconds or so, okay? So you're going to see it's about a third of the way through from the left. On the right side of the green line, it's all squiggly, right? But a new pattern is about to take over because that's when we're doing the rhythm check. So it's taking over and you're going to see these rhythmical, very beautiful complexes, okay? So I'm going to play that now Guys, and you can see those changing over. Like, have we got a pulse? We have a pulse. So, so now you can see they're like very nice complexes. There's these squiggles that are like like that, right? It's more incompatible with heart rate. And it says a heart rate of 79 there. Vic is checking manually as well that if there's a pulse, if you can feel a pulse, because that would give us an indication of whether we need to actually stop CPR or carry on going. Yeah, I can feel We have a pulse, okay. That so we do have a pulse now. So final question is what do you do next? Do you continue with CPR? Do you leave the patient there and off you go to the next patient? Do you contact ICU for post-resuscitation care? Or do you restart the antibiotics that started this mess in the first place, all right? Um, so I'm gonna give you guys a few seconds to answer that and let's see what you guys think. Right, so well done. Majority of you guys are saying, contact ICU for post-resuscitation care because you know the patient is still not out of danger yet. Although we've managed to get them back, the patient needs to be under significant monitoring. They may end up going into cardiac arrest again. They had a massive thing. They were essentially dead. We brought them back to life. So they need um, ICU care. And also you wanna also contact the family, let them know what's happened, get them to come in if they can um, and go from there, all right? That's fine. So let's keep um, the oxygen going through the eye gel. Um, what we'll do, Maya, do you mind just calling the family, letting them know what's happened? Mm -hmm. um, I'll make a phone call to ITU and um, let's see if we can get Sam in on their, on their ward just for post resuscitation care. Um, and Vic, can you just, are you happy continuing with that shortly yeah. for a while whilst we get a bit more help? All right, guys, thank you very much, team. Right, so that is the end of the simulation. Um, Mathura, do you mind just swapping over? back to the PowerPoint presentation, please, just so I can talk to you guys through very quickly, just another four or five minutes um, of um, just kind of some advice and general things that we can offer you guys as well. So firstly, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed that, gave you guys an opportunity of um, what we've 
you know, what I think is going to be super useful for you guys to talk about in your interviews, also to see what doctors do in real time, in real life scenarios, but obviously using a simulation to maintain patient confidentiality. Right, so I just want to take up another few minutes of your time. I know I'm over running. I've only got a few minutes left. I just want to talk to you guys very quickly through something that we didn't cover, which is the UCAS stuff side of things, okay? So obviously on the, on the presentation, you've already seen the Medical Life Prize draw. If you haven't done that, make sure you join that. We'll come on to that soon. So UCAP preparation. Um, Obviously, normally I do like a tutorial, kind of because of time, haven't had the chance to do that today. But essentially, I would give you guys a full introduction to the UK on the Samda U on the Samda YouTube page. You can find that video. You can also find that video on the Medic Life YouTube page as well, uh, the Medic Life website as well. But essentially, just going to take a few minutes of the kind of UCAT stuff we have can offer you guys. I'm really happy to announce that we work really closely with Medify. Now, Medify is one of the one of the biggest question banks out there. They have over ten thousand questions eight full UCAT mocks and 18 mini mocks. And just to give you guys a brief introduction of what UCAT is, it's an exam that you guys are gonna to need to sit from July till sometime in October and 30 universities require that exam. The only other exam is the BMAT. This is for the undergrad courses. And then if you're a graduate applying for medicine or dentistry, then you need to do the GAMSA. But we're talking about the UCAT today because this is a test that 34,000 people sat last year. So you've got a lot of competition. And in my experience of the last 10 years and of the last five years, I've been helping people get into med school and dental school. This is going to be the most important thing that's going to determine whether you get that offer for interview or not. Okay, so you can't mess about here. This is something that you're really going to have to put in the work for, and this is going to differentiate or decide whether you get an offer for interview or not. And then you've got the interviews to worry about. But essentially, the medic life, um, we do one day full UCAT courses um, to give you all the different tips, techniques, and strategies that for you guys to to implement. But then you need to prepare with that. You need to practice those techniques and this is where Medify comes in. So Medify have been going on for ages. I even used their subscription when I was applying 10 years ago and we now work with them to give you a really, really affordable course package, a bundle with a full day UCAT course and a two month subscription to Medify's question bank, which is over 10,000 questions, like I said, eight full mocks, 18 mini mocks, and we are also throwing in the Medify's personal um, right, personal statement writer app for free. Okay, so essentially the prices are here, and now those are the dates that are currently live on the Medic Life website. So again, uh, if you go on the Medic Life website, you can see those dates. Now the first three courses, the 30th of May, 13th of June, and the 4th of July, had sold out. I have added 15 spaces just for today because you guys, I know some of you guys would have wanted to join. So there's 15 extra spaces available because those courses had sold out, but I've made them available because I know some of you guys would want to join that. The online UCAT course is £55. We've designed it so it is affordable for you guys, and I'll talk about the bursary in a second as well. But essentially, it's affordable. Um, you know, they will, if you do your research, there are companies out there charging in excess of £200, £300. And the Medify bundle, so the UCAT course with a two-month subscription to Medify and their personal statement right trap is only £90. So you're saving £45. That's a huge, huge, huge saving. And I'm so grateful to Medify to allowing um, our students to benefit from this because it's just like Samda, Medify and the Medic Life, all three of us, you know, we have this passion about widening access. We want to make things as affordable. We want to get rid of that gap between those from high social or economic backgrounds and those from low social economic backgrounds where, you know, just because if you have a lot of money, you've got good resources. The idea is, you know, good resources don't have to cost the world. And I'm just going to talk very briefly about, um, about the bursary. But yeah, so just remember, 15 extra spaces have been released today for those first three courses. Um, right, so let's go on to another exciting thing for you guys. So just for today, again, we are giving you guys £5 off. So if you use the SAMDA5 um, discount code at checkout on the website today, just for today, you'll get an extra £5 off. Okay, that's only because SAMDA are awesome. All right, so I'm gonna leave that on. And again, if Mathura, you guys can, if you can maybe run that code as a ticker at the bottom, just for the next two minutes, just so people um, can keep that. We'll take a picture of the screen as I move on to the next slide. It'll be amazing. So Samda5 will give you five pounds off that course. Um, right up, so next up is regular work experience opportunities. So this is a new thing that we have also started. Um, I've only got two minutes left, so don't worry, I will finish on. To, uh, will finish relatively quickly. So regular work experience, I'm sure you guys have enjoyed that today, but we're planning more of these sessions, more sim sessions, problem-based learning. You guys have may have heard of that term before. What is PBL, problem-based learning? Well, you know what we're gonna do? The Medic Life has got lots of med students within the, within the team. We're gonna get them together and we're gonna get you guys to see them and interact with them as they run a PBL scenario. So when they ask you at your interview, what do you know about PBL? You can say, well, you know what? I've done it. 
I've actually been involved in one run by med students thanks to the Medic Life, and they have actually shown us the benefits and pros and cons of it. We're going to do more teaching sessions. I did one on stroke last Sunday, which is again saved. Um, and these regular work experience sessions are also going to be more sim sessions like the one today, case studies and scenarios, talks from different members of the MDT. Um, I am very fortunate, I work with amazing people at work, so I've got lots of contacts who will come and give you these talks. Now, these are planned every two to three weeks. It's going to be a one-hour session on a weekend on Zoom. We want to control the numbers, so these are only available for free to people who sign up to the UPAC course, okay? You don't have to pay anything for it. But because of safeguarding, as you guys would have heard from Standard today, and we have to control who comes in, we have to see who's there and those kind of things. Um, so because of that reason, we can only make these available to those of you who sign up to the UPAC course. And even if you sign up today, you will automatically be given the link and the password for the previous stroke talk I did on Sunday. Um, something that is really close to my heart I want to talk to you guys about today is widening access and again all of us are here today thanks to Samda who massively believe in that as well. So on that slide you can see on the top picture you've got me and my three brothers. So the three of us, uh, we were born in Pakistan, we moved over to the UK in 2003 and you know my mom worked really hard, we worked really hard to get to where we are today. We came from a really low economic background where our household income was less than £20,000. Now in the bottom picture, what you see going from left to right is you see my younger brother Umar, who's a foundation year one doctor. Then next you see Bilal, who's an ED registrar, emergency medicine registrar. Then you see me, I'm a foundation year two doctor. And then the, and the, the youngest member of the family on the right is Walid, who is the director of operations in the medic life. He's been running all the Mentimeter stuff today. Um, he does all your emails and things. And he's a junior, he's a medical student at St. George's University of London, right? So the four of us have kind of made it. And what we want to do is help you guys do the same, whether it's medicine or dentistry. So if your household income is below 20K, you will be eligible for 50% of all medical life courses, whether that's UCAT or its interview courses. We also had the Dr. Rashid Ahmed scholarship, which essentially gave you guys um, a free application to medicine or dentistry. We took care of all your costs, but for 2021, that deadline has closed. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about that. But we really believe in widening access, and I'm really grateful for um, Samda helping us talk about this stuff today. So yeah, and finally, this winter coming along will be the one day MMI courses. These used to be in person before, but this year we ran them all virtually. They were an incredible success. We've had tons and tons of our students get into med school and dental school, which has been absolutely incredible. But essentially, these are all delivered by doctors, dentists, and med students. It's a one day course. You get two full mock MMI circuits. Um, and you get personalized feedback at each station and we also trial a one-to-one -one interview all within the same price So keep your eyes out for that Make sure you've subscribed to the Medic Life website so you get the details and information regarding that when they come back this November and finally don't forget the Medic Life prize draw to win your personal statement review. Make sure you follow the Medic Life on Instagram. Go and subscribe to the website. Just type in Medic Life into Google. It'll come up and take a picture at some point today or now this is your last chance to do it Tag me and I will announce the winner for the personal statement review this evening. Guys, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor talking to you guys today. Um, thank you so much to everyone at Samda for having me. I hope you guys enjoyed that session. I'm going to leave it here um, and hope you guys enjoy the rest of the amazing session that um, Samda team have organized for you. Thank you very much. And I will hopefully see you in a few years time as my junior doctors. Oh, that would be so nice. Um, if some of our audience is like, oh, hi, Dr. Bacta. You were there when incredible. I had your work experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you very much for organizing such an engaging um, experience. It was particularly interesting to see um, how you use communication, leadership, and team work skills to yeah. help a patient in an emergency. Um, and also thank you for um, sharing with all of us the uh, widening participation work you do. I think that could really help some of our students as well. I think it's just incredible. It's inspiring, again, for Sam to side of things as well. I think there's something as, you know, when, when you get to a stage where you have the opportunity to help people just like you guys are doing as well, I think I think it's, it's our moral responsibility to give back. So, so yeah, you know, all the credit goes to you guys as well for making this event possible. So guys, all of you watching at home, make sure you give a nice shout out to Sam that they have worked incredibly hard to put this together. Um, right, I think I've run over time. So sorry about that, but I'll take my leave now so the next guest can come on. Um, but again, thank you very much for having me and enjoy yeah, the rest of the event, guys. You. See you later. Bye-bye, thank you. All right, so. Now we're moving on to the dental portion of today's event. First up, we have um, Dr. Yunus, 
who is a senior clinical lecturer in paediatric dentistry at Barts in London, as well as staff president of Barts Dental Society. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. And yes, shout out to Dr. Bakhtar, because my heart rate is definitely racing now after watching that simulation. I definitely think I belong in dentistry rather than in medicine. <laughs> so I'll just lower the blood, the pressure of the room a little bit. And I realise you all guys have had a really long morning already full of presentations. So I'll stay on point as we are a little bit behind schedule. And I'll try and keep this quite light and uh, friendly to that. So first of all, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. And can I just say, who am I? Well, me, we all love to talk about ourselves. So give, give me the pleasure of having a couple of minutes of indulging. So this is me as uh, I've just you know, been introduced. I'm a senior clinical lecturer at Barts in the London and my field is paediatric dentistry. So as well as being a lecturer who teaches, who's supervising undergraduate dental students, both in the laboratories, teaching them dental skills, and on the clinics with patient treatment, delivering lectures, all that kind of usual rigmarole that uni life brings. As well as that, I'm the third year BDS academic lead, which means that out of the five years of dentistry, I'm sort of lead up the third year of your uh, dental career when you're at Barts in the London, um, which means if you have any issues, any problems, anything at all, you come to me and I run the curriculum for that particular year. And the year, the third year is pretty good year, which most dental students will tell you because it's a kind of halfway point. It's that breather in the middle of the five year long course where we have a usually a medway ball, a midway ball, which basically allows us to let our hair down, have a good time and kind of take stock of where we're at as far as our dental career goes. And as was just mentioned, I'm also the Bart's Dental Society staff president. Whenever you go to uni, it's about a lot more than just doing medicine or dentistry. It's about partaking fully in uni life, having lots of extracurricular stuff going on, and the Barts and the London Dental Society is a great way of doing that. And as the president, again, we're in charge of all the dental dinners, the balls, the graduation balls, charity events. I mean, only a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a dumping, dumpling making class with some of the charity officers. Um, so we do, we've do. we been carrying on our work online despite the COVID issues that we've been having. So um, I definitely would say, please, you know, if you do make it into medicine and dentistry, which I hope you do, um, if that's where your heart is, then definitely join the societies when you get to university. So the little arrow points to me. That's me, the little brown girl there with the class of lots of people. I came from a regular state school, not a very, very privileged background. But I worked hard um, to achieve the grades I needed um, to sort of put me forward for most careers because I had no clue whatsoever what I was going to do and where I was going to end up. What I did know was that I was quite academic. I was a bit spotty or nerdy, quite confident. I enjoyed being creative, particularly drama and presenting. I liked being on stage and much to my parents' horror um, because they definitely didn't want me to pursue a career in drama or television or anything like that but I did like fine art and messing about with jewellery and things like that and also on the other side of things I was also quite caring I cared about what was happening around me I usually showed a lot of empathy towards my friends and colleagues and people that I worked with and in the family I came from a large family so empathy sort of ran through me but at the same time I knew there were times where I wanted to shut off and enjoy my own company as well which sort of led me towards thinking, what kind of career could I end up in? Now, coming from an Asian family, the career choices I were given were really doctor, lawyer and engineer. And if I didn't make it into any of those, then I was a disgrace to the family. Really, that was the fourth option. However, there was also this window of opportunity on the side which was dentistry, which was like medicine. I knew I'd get the title doctor, which would make parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents happy that I'd achieved something. But at the same time, I might be doing some, something a little bit more pernickety, manual dexterity, something that might be more personable, one-to-one -one relationship with patients and a little bit more continuity of care, seeing the pe same patients again and again. There's something that might lend itself to me. And luckily for me, 
my mum was quite supportive of this because she thought it was a good career for women thinking forward that if I had babies and whatnot then I'd be able to go back into the field and not be left behind so when I looked into dentistry I also realized that dentists should have certain specific qualities and one of the major ones which is why it's at the top of my list is communication skills if you cannot speak to people on their own level so whether that's an older person a younger person somebody with a learning difficulty you need to get down to that person's level and communicate with them and a dentist is someone who must have excellent communication skills you cannot treat someone if you cannot communicate with them if you can't find that rapport with them because within five minutes of meeting someone who may be having an excruciating toothache, you need to be make them feel comfortable within the dental chair in that dental setting, which is quite a scary place to be. You've got to say, I think majority of the population don't enjoy going to the dentist, me included. I don't like being the patient, you know, so that's where my empathy comes from. But you need to be able to communicate with people, get down to their level and speak to them and make them feel comfortable within five minutes of meeting them. And um, let's face it, apart from gynecologists, I think dentists are the only people who can really do that. So you need to have communication skills. So if that's the sort of thing that you do possess, then this may be the career for you. Try and think about yourself and wonder if you're detail orientated. Do you look at the pernickety details? Are you a perfectionist? Do you like to get things just so? If so, again, you lend yourself well to dentistry. Do you have good dexterity? Are you, be a, are you able to do fine skilled motor skills? You know, can you do henna painting or can you ice a cake or do you play a musical instrument? I mean, what kind of dexterity skills do you have in your everyday life that might lend yourself better to dentistry? And something that Dr. Bakhtal demonstrated brilliantly within that sim exercise there that we just watched, leadership skills. It, as a dentist, whether it's a general dental practitioner or somebody on a dental ward in a hospital, you need to be the lead clinician. You need to be able to stand up and give orders in a concise way and lead your team around you, whether it be in a dental surgery, getting the nurses what you, to do what you need to do, instructing the receptionist what she needs to do. You need those leadership skills. So you need to be quite an organized person as well. And be patient. Things don't always go how we want them to go. And um, I think this is something that goes hand in hand with medicine as well. You've got to have bags of patience. Things do not always happen how we would like them to happen. You know, it's not an ideal scenario if the impression you've just had mix up and the nurse has mixed it up and it's been mixed with warm water, yet your patient's not opening their mouth. So it's set in the bowl. You've not even got to the mouth yet then you start all over again or if you have somebody who's particularly anxious and will not allow you to do the treatment you need to do you know it's having it's finding that patience and finding those communication skills to open up the scenario so that you're able to perform the dentistry you need to perform to make sure your patient receives the care they need and that's thinking on your feet which takes us nicely on to physical stamina. You spend a hell of a lot of time as a dentist sitting, but actually it's quite hard work because your arms, your shoulders are tense, your arms are in front of you, and you're physically working with your lots of upper body. And now that I work in a dental hospital, I'm forever running up and down the clinic, running into one bay to another bay to see what students are doing. So basically, you do need to have some physical stamina. So, you know, don't think that because you're sat down or you don't have to be, you know, um, too strong or you have too much physical stamina, because actually it's quite physically demanding. And at the end of the day, which I'm sure my family will vouch for, all I want to do is kick off my shoes and lie on the sofa, you know, and just mong for a bit, because that's how I feel. I need to be just relaxed and away from all the tensions of what I've been doing on clinic. And as I alluded to earlier, problem solving skills, you need to be able to think on your feet. Things don't always go to plan and you've got to have a plan B, C and sometimes D ready. But if you're the sort of person who gets quite flustered if things don't go your way and you're going to feel quite upset about that, maybe dentistry isn't for you because in dentistry, things will go awry. 
and you may necessarily not necessarily have everything to hand that you need. They may have run out of that particular material you wanted or that particular shade of thinking. What can you do instead? What can you do in that situation to make sure the patient is happy, the team you're working with, the nursing staff are happy, and that you're happy and satisfied that you've done the best thing you could to give your patient the care they needed. So you need to be able to sort of be thinking about that as well. So I thought about all of that. And with the support of my mum, I did decide to go um, forward and apply for dentistry. I ended up um, at um, Guy's and St. Thomas's Dental School, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now been sort of gazumped as part of King's Hospital. And I think that's been like that for several years now. I think over, uh, I think we were the last year to qualify as Guy's graduates. But I had a fantastic time there. Uh, I, I travelled from being a northern lass to come and live at university away from home. And that's something I thoroughly recommend. You don't have to, just because you're in London, it doesn't mean you have to apply for London schools. Just because you're up north, it doesn't mean you have to apply for northern schools. If you if the budget allows it and you are, you're happy to take on the financial burden of things, because obviously it's a lot more expensive for you guys than it was for me back then, I would recommend moving away from home and experiencing a fuller uni life, which involves going to the balls, um, having all the fun that comes alongside uh, being part of the societies and the sports clubs and all the other things, which is just lends itself better. Uh, and growing up as a rounded person, you know, as a young adult, living away from home, managing your own finances, uh, cooking your own food, doing your own laundry, all that sort of thing. Um, which university lends itself to. And I graduated there with my dean, um, Professor Frank Ashley, who sadly passed away now, um, with my BDS uh, honours as a Bachelor of Dental Surgery. Moving on, I thought I was going to end up in general practice for the rest of my life and live happily ever after. So the plan was do vocational training. That's what we all do. We, if you want to be a general dental practitioner, GDP, you undertake vocational training. And that involves a year of training within a trainee practice where you have a principal practitioner who's the, the dentist who owns the practice. They also have special training to be a BT trainer. And it, as a vocational trainer, it means they might have additional skills in teaching you how to do things, looking after you, knowing that you may request certain materials that you're familiar with from dental school rather than throwing you in the deep end and expecting you to sink or swim. And the idea is that when you do this vocational training, you have a day off in the middle of the week on the Wednesdays where you go off to the local um, hospital and you meet up with other postgraduates in dentistry. And there might be people from Manchester Dental School or Liverpool Dental School, depends which area of the country you end up in. And you'll meet other VT trainees who are also going to come along and have a moan about their trainer or share what materials they're using or tell them telling you tips and tricks on how to manage nurses, because obviously, remember, you're going in at the bottom of the practice level as a vocational trainer. You're the, probably the youngest person in the practice, even though you're trying to sort of um, give this air of knowing what you're doing because you're a qualified dentist now. Not everybody might want to take you seriously. So it's about learning those skills of how to manage being in practice for the very first time, how to manage dealing with staff who might not want to take you so seriously or manage how to make sure you get what you want out of the practice you know practice the skills that you want to skills that you want to do so that you get really confident at doing them but you've still got the safety net of knowing that their principal practitioner your trainer is just upstairs in the surgery upstairs you know to lend you a hand if you get stuck in a sticky situation you know, that's the idea that you've got someone to turn to for help. So it's a really nice safety net doing vocational training. And you've still got your postgrads who you meet up with and share stories with. And you have somebody who looks after all the postgrads who you can go to if there are any issues or problems or any kind of nightmares you might be having. And then get further advice at how to manage those difficulties in vocational training. I ended up in a small village back home. I went back towards Manchester and went out, I, I, you know, because obviously I'm a vocational trainee. I now have money, you know, um, and when I qualified back in back in the heyday, I think I had twenty seven thousand pounds to my name and I didn't know what to do with it. Apart from paying off my student loan, 
it really was, you know, surplus to me. And I bought myself a nice car and decided I was going to have a few nice things, you know, that I couldn't afford before as a poor student. And it really was a really nice way of entering the working arena, knowing that I was quite comfortable. I know the money might not be as great today, but it is still very good for the hours that we do as vocational trainees, because you're going in at nine and you're out at five. So it really is a nice nine to five job and you don't have to do emergencies if you don't want to. You know, you'd have to talk to your trainer about these sort of things. So it's a really nice time to kind of find your feet, put yourself on the property ladder, do what you need to do um, uh, before you take the next step. So that's what I did for the first year. Realised I loved being in practice. So I applied. I applied for associate positions. And my job that I ended up was in a small village called Clitheroe, which is a had a royal grammar school. It's quite a nice posh little village up north. And this is the time I used to build up my skills and confidence at doing procedures alone as an independent clinician. I still knew there were other principles in the practice if I needed them. But now you're coming in as a grown up, if you will, qualified general dental practitioner and people are coming to see you and taking your advice as in what treatment they should do. Um, they want to know how much it's going to cost, what the payment plans are, how many appointments it would take, would it be uncomfortable, all these sort of things. So you need to keep reading, keep learning, keep attending CPD courses, you know, continuing professional development. I can't emphasize how important that was in these early years as an associate because that's what builds your confidence and at the same time as that you're also working in a team with your nurses you're learning to assert yourself as a lead clinician so being assertive without being aggressive of course you know look, practicing those communication skills making sure that you're able to say you know um, could you just pass me uh, x y or z rather than uh, excuse me uh, please um, do you mind, uh, you know, and it's working on that confidence of how to speak to your team and how to make sure you get what you need when you need it. So it's a really kind of steep learning curve when you first qualify and become your own boss, if you will. Um, so even though here you've got somebody else as your boss, and an associate means that you earn 50 percent of everything you do because the other 50 percent goes to the person whose name's above the door is their practice. You're not, it's not your practice. So, of course, but there are some overhead costs the costs of paying nurses, the costs of um, ordering materials, the costs of doing lab fees. So, 50% of everything is given to you that you earn, and the other 50% is goes to the practice and to the lab technicians for the work that you have ordered. So, again, very comfortable living. I'm not going to lie. And um, it gives you a really nice way set up into life. And this is where a lot of dentists will stop and think, you know what? This is great. I've arrived. I'm happy. I'm an associate. I'm going to think about getting perhaps some kind of finance in order and buying my own practice. For me, this didn't happen because other things happened. I decided that actually I was going to go into corporate dentistry and I joined this particular firm who was based in London City. So I ended up moving back from the sticks up north, back to the city again, back to the life that I enjoyed because being at Guy's and Tommy's, I was used to being in London and it was in my blood now. And I ended up working in the corporate field. And it, this meant I was a dentist, but I was a dentist within a law firm or within BP, British Petroleum or HSBC, Lehman Brothers. I worked in all these companies as an associate dental practice practitioner for Bupa, which was the corporate um, company that I worked for. It was quite lucrative. I was paid very well and I managed to accumulate rather a lot of handbags and other things at that time. And it satisfied me. But one of the things that struck me about, which was very different to being an associate in general dental practice, was the type of people I was seeing. I was seeing busy corporate lawyers who were coming in and saying, I want you to do my checkup now, or weren't even looking at me because I had a male nurse sitting aside me. They assumed that he was the dentist and I was the nurse because the stereotypes were at pay play there, you know, and talking to my nurse and saying, you know, I need you to, you know, do X, Y, and Z for me. And at which point, 
my nurse would very kindly redirect them and say, well, perhaps you need to speak to the dentist then, you know, and sort of put the ball back into my court. But it's it's funny how you think something's really going to suit you and be great. And I was there for, you know, a number of years and I loved it. And like I said, it was financially rewarding, but it was a little bit soul destroying because the whole point of me doing dentistry was that I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to be in charge. I wanted to be the one who was running the show. And all of a sudden I had, and lawyers are scary people, don't get me wrong, especially corporate lawyers. And you're worried they're going to sue you if you do something wrong. So I had that additional pressure on me and I had the feeling that I wasn't in control of everything. So I had to really be quite assertive and say, actually, why don't you take a seat, Mr. So-and-so, and and we'll have a little look and then we'll discuss what needs to be done, shall we? And it was done in a nice, soft tone. Those communication skills coming in again, just to get someone to calm down, sit down and realign and readdress the balance of power in the room. Because as the lead clinician, that's your job. That's your job, being the dentist. So I did this for a number of years. And like I said, and during this time, I met my lovely husband, who also worked in the city. We ended up getting married, having a couple of kids, and started the next chapter of our life. There's my lovely babies there. And it's during this time that I actually went part-time and took a step away from corporate dentistry and decided, you know what? This is not for me anymore. I am going to take a step back. I joined a locum branch. So there's lots and lots of companies that will have you to do locuming, go in when people need you. So it was easy for childcare. I went from full time to part time. So I wasn't working as much so I could take spend more time with my kids. But I continued with the continual professional development. So I kept going to the courses, kept keeping my hands wet, as we call it. So using the dexterity so you don't lose your confidence, guys, because that's really important in dentistry. Because picking up a drill, which is rotating at a very high speed and placing that within someone's enamel on their tooth and within their mouth, quite a squarey concept. So you really need to keep that skills going. So even though I'd taken this step back, I was continuing with part time work and really reflecting on what I wanted from dentistry. Where was my next step going to be? Because it seemed as if corporate dentistry had taken me away from the soul of dentistry, the thing I really wanted to do. So after lots of reflection and personal kind of thought, and I know reflections come up again and again today, you know, thinking about what you're doing and improving things, seeing what can I do better? What can I change about the situation? And the change I elicited was actually applying, looking through the BDJ, looking for jobs vacant and coming across something for the Community Dental Service, CDS. This is something I didn't really know much about. I knew they did special care dentistry. That's all I knew from my uni days. And I didn't really, you know, give it much thought. But I went to the interview. I did really well. I told them honestly why I wanted to do the job. And my kids were part of that decision because I realized that actually money wasn't the biggest thing because this was going to be a salaried job. It didn't matter how many patients I saw, I was going to get a fixed rate of pay. So that was, you know, something that factored in. And I spoke about this in my interview. I talked to them about how I wanted to give back to the community rather than just take things, which I'd been doing previously, I think, in the corporate job. And that's me just bearing my soul and being completely honest with you. And you know what? It went really well. I got the job. I started working with special needs patients. There's, you know, you can see in these pictures, wheelchair hoist, wheelchair tilts, lots of specialist equipment, working with really limited patients who might have limited manual dexterity, have real specialist needs. So the dentistry actually becomes elevated to another level of interest. So it's not just about the teeth and the mouth doing the box standard dentistry. I'd gained those skills already. Now it was about one, changing the communication up the next notch which is even more elevated because every patient here would need to know clearly and concisely, according to the limited amount of knowledge they may have or possess, what treatment I was going to do. And sometimes that was through a carer. Sometimes that's through a medical team. Sometimes I was going off to care homes and I'd be bent upon my knees, um, applying temporary fillings to elderly patients. Sometimes I was making dentures for somebody who was in palliative care. You know, and there was lots of pediatrics in this as well. The whole 
community dental thing just threw the whole dentistry thing upside down for me and it opened up a whole new world of dentistry for me because it was fantastic it was eye opening i loved it and i did this for several years and it really really i really felt each day that when i came home yes i was tired yes my back hurt because i'd been we you know kneeling over or uh, bending over a wheelchair all day long or being on my knees in the care home or man you know or managed to get my finger bitten by a special needs patient because i hadn't been wearing a finger cover but what i actually had discovered is that actually this is what was really keeping my mind ticking over keeping the dentistry really fresh so i loved it and it's during this time that i decided i particularly loved pediatrics because i was able to be a bit funny um really be silly with it and do lots of non-dental banter as well with the children and really deal with challenging cases which had been sent in from the general dental practitioners who hadn't managed to access into the patient's mouth because they wouldn't open or they were too nervous or they were too upset and then as a community dental surgeon it was my job to get in there and do whatever treatment was needed perhaps sometimes i would have to end up referring for general anesthetic again i did these in the local hospital i would go along one day a week and do general anesthesia and do all the extractions other days i did relative analgesia i did a bit more training and i did gas and air on patients so they did inhalation sedation which just gave them the ability to relax a little bit and then i'd do the treatment so i, I picked up a whole whole um, adjunct of skills which really helped me in my um journey of of kind of specializing you know becoming a bit more niche with what i wanted to do and in an attempt to kind of hone my skills i looked into doing a more pediatric based qualification and i ended up going to the eastman dental school in london because that's where i was based now in london doing all this community dental care um and i just ended up uh doing uh, my postgraduate qualification so i hit the books again and um, decided pediatrics was the way forward for me and that's what i um did and it was the best decision ever because i love it and um however many years on i miss community dentistry but it gave me the ability when i was in community dentistry one of the things that they had in the community dental service is there was the opportunity to go and teach in a, in a dental school in one of the local dental schools which happened to be barts for me because i was working in barking and dagenham and havering and the northeast london foundation trust healthcare and i managed to get myself out and just um get myself a position where i was going in one day a week as an honorary clinical lecturer and teaching the students on clinic which was amazing for me because as a, as an undergraduate sitting in the lecture theater i used to sort of look adoringly at my lecturers down there in the um lecture theater and think gosh i'd love to do what they're doing you know and teach other future dentists and you know what that's what i ended up doing because that one day a week an opportunity came up for a full time post and i grabbed it and now i work part time because you know i have other commitments and things but i'm at queen mary's university of london which is barts and the london and i teach on the clinics these is one of our nurses and some of our students on clinic and it's an open plan kind of situation where i supervise fifth years fourth years third years all on clinics and with pediatric patients in the chair and also we do lectures lab skills and we do all the teaching in um on all the usual academic stuff that you would do at a university so being a pediatric dentist has not limited me it's opened up lots and lots of uh, new things but i still do my own clinic with my own patients which means that i can still do that fun silly banter and i do that when i go al along on clinic with my fifth year students or fourth year students if they've got someone in the chair and they're not able to get into the mouth i will sit down and try my best to do what needs to be done so i still keep my hands wet i'm still there chair side doing the dentistry that i love to do and also hopefully imparting knowledge to other future clinicians who might want to um become uh, pediatric dentists or 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 de general dentists you know or whichever field of dentistry people choose to go to but i know that i have done something that i'm happy with because every day I feel satisfied. I've done a good job. 
Um, I've enjoyed myself. I love speaking to my students and patients and parents. And yes, you have pretty days. You have days where you have a difficult mum or parent who doesn't want you to do the treatment that you're doing, even though you know it's the best thing for that patient. And it's up to you to look at the research and be able to eloquently put across your point as to why you feel as the clinician. So again, you're going back to that lead clinician status and being able to deliver the message to the parent why you think it's the best treatment for their child to have, you know. And if it's something that you do on your own parent or child, then obviously that's the thing that you should be advocating for somebody else's. So, yeah, so this definitely is the right journey for me. And I've kept it short and sweet because I'm aware you guys have had a long morning already and um, we are a little bit behind time. But I just want to say thank you to the Samda team and thank you to you guys for tuning in. And also, just to finally add a few tips, uh, work experience, definitely pick up as much work experience as you can. I know it's really tricky with the whole COVID thing. It shook our world as dentists. It shook our world. The number of colleagues I have who are general dental practitioners who did not work for months, whose mortgages did not get paid because we didn't know what was happening. You know, the British Dental Association was a little bit slow to act with that. And it's only after we get we got our act together and we knew that PPE was the way forward. It was safe to get patients back in the chair. And now we're treating patients in a very different way than we were trained to do. You know, literally, I'm covered from head to toe in plastics before I can see any patient. But at least I'm seeing patients again. We're working through the general anesthetic list. We're working through seeing the patients who need to be seen. Because like everybody else, our world changed as well. And we were, you know, a lot of us were redeployed on different wards. Um, people went on to maternity wards, doing things they weren't trained to do, but it was all hands on deck with this pandemic. And I think that comes back to the empathy, the caring nature. Just like the medics, we wanted to do the best that we could. Our nurses were turning patients in the resus um, uh, clinics. You know, we, we all had our own harrowing experience of COVID and some are continuing to. We're only just opening up fully, guys, from, from what has happened. But you know what? Dentistry continued. We went online very quickly. We adapted. We started delivering all our lectures online, seminars and all the things. And we managed to learn new IT skills so that we could uh, manage to do that. But I would definitely say if you can get work experience outside in dentistry, do it. And the point that I think Dr. Dipesh uh, Gopal mentioned earlier about having a life outside of dentistry or medicine, definitely. When you put your applications in, don't just put down, I've got A star stars and blah, 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 all the academic stuff. Great. That means you're level with everybody else who's applying. But you know what? You need to have something else, some kind of something out release, some release for once you finish your dentistry. What do you do after that? You can't go home and think about dentistry and medicine all night. You need to have something else which occupies your mind. I'm very, you know, early on in my career when I was a vocational trainee um, in that little village, when I used to get into my car at the end of the day and shut the door. That thud of the door shutting, the car door shutting, was a signal to my mind to switch off, stop thinking about dentistry, and now it's time to think about home life. So you've got to have that work-life balance, have something extracurricular, and it shows you to be a more well-rounded person, whether it be singing in a choir, swimming in a pool, um, pursuing some kind of sports activity, something that shows that you're, you do more and are able to release any kind of energies that you have outside in a life outside of dentistry. So do apply if you think you, you're, you've got what it takes to be a dentist. Like I said, if you're dentistry material, we want you at Bart's, definitely apply. But do think about applying to schools further afield, you know, because university is a lot more than just a course or doing the degree and get, gaining that qualification. It's five years of your life, guys, and you really want to make the most of it and do as much as you can, pile in as much experience as you can, life experience, as well as just the dentistry part of it. And I think um, if you think you're still up for it, then hopefully, um, fingers crossed, I might see some of you in the future when you come along um, to the admissions interviews and things, which are all online now. 
um, thanks to COVID. But hopefully um, that's, you know, that's the way that um, we might go. So thank you very much for your time. And I know there will be an opportunity to ask questions later on. And I'll, at that point, I'll hand you back to uh, the ladies. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Eunice. Um, yes, there. as you just said, there will be plenty of opportunities for all of you to submit your questions. And Dr. Eunice, I'm sure, will um, be happy to answer them. Thank you for sharing your insight into um, your journey. And also, um, you gave a lot of really valuable information that our aspiring medical um, dental students, aspiring dental students, can use in their personal statements and their interviews which of course is the purpose of today. So thank you very much. Now, we're so pleased to introduce our dental virtual simulation provided by Immersify Education. This hands-on session will be uh, delivered by Areej, who is a second year dental student and also an Immersify Education ambassador. She will be using the Immersify Education app to guide you through the case. In order to get the full hands-on experience, please download the free Immersify Education app. We will now show a quick video with the instructions of how to do this. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for being here and for Samda for allowing me to give you this talk today. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to Dr. Yunus for her talk because it was really good. Um, Dr. Yunus actually teaches me um, pediatric, den pediatric dentistry this year, I had a few lectures with her. So it was really nice to hear more about her story and everything. So I hope you guys enjoyed that as well. So today I'll be guiding you through the Immersify Dental app telling you more about it and how I think it can help you with your application process and also just gaining a bit more experience when it comes to dentistry. So a little bit about me. My name's Uriej. I'm a second year dental student at Barts of the London, um, like, like they said. And um, not too long ago, actually, just like two years ago, I was in the exact same position as you guys applying to dental school and going through the application process. So why did I choose dentistry? There's quite a few reasons that led me to choose dentistry, but I would say my two main ones were the fact that you have a mixture of science and creativity when it comes to dentistry. This is something I really liked because I am someone who really enjoys science, you know, especially biology. I really loved biology at school and it's something that you do a lot of when it comes to dentistry you know we don't just learn about the mouth we learn about the whole human body as well and on top of that the creativity aspect is something that I think is really nice and really fun you know I've always had a creative side of me and the fact that I can do this in dentistry as well was something that really appealed to me here actually you can see a picture very recently I did my first ever filling prep and it was really fun, but also quite a bit more difficult than I expected, you know, using a drill for the first time. Um, yeah, it requires a lot more skill than you would expect. But yeah, it was really fun. And I know it's not perfect, but I was happy with how that turned out. And my second reason I would have to say is the fact that you could have such a positive impact on patients. This is something that I was lucky enough to see when I did work experience back in year 12 and year 13 
you know, you could have someone walk into your dental surgery and they could be like in so much pain or they could have a problem and you could sort it out within the same appointment and then they'll be leaving feeling a lot more happier and that's something that I really like the fact that you can have that positive impact on patients so these two main reasons is what led me to decide yes dentistry is for me it's something that I can really see myself doing um, I want to tell you a little bit about how the pandemic has affected me as a dental student so previously um, before lockdown before everything um, we had the full uni experience and it was my first time going to uni and having lectures and everything like that you know meeting people so many new people because I had been in the same school since year seven so that's a long time from year seven to year 13 and suddenly I'm in this new environment you know meeting new people for the first time so that was really fun really amazing and we also had clinical exposure from first year this is actually a video from first year we did like we were practicing polishing teeth so that was really fun as well because when you have a lot of lectures especially in first year we had so many lectures so having that clinical exposure is really fun and it kind of gives you a bit more to do and um takes your mind a bit off you know studying so that was something that was really amazing and um, unfortunately, um, my first year was cut short when lockdown happened. I believe it was in late March and we got sent home and everything became online. And it was so crazy because we thought it would last for maybe a few weeks and then we'll be back on clinics. But we all know that didn't happen, unfortunately. So moving on to second year, because luckily we had finished all our first year lectures by um by when lockdown hit so we weren't affected that much but when it came to second year um all my lectures were online and um it was very different you know we moved from having lectures in the lecture theater to all online and now personally i actually really like online lectures i think it's really um for me personally it's more um, I, I can learn better from online lectures because I like the fact that you can do everything from your uh, with your own time and I feel like the interaction is better you know you can ask questions on the platform that we use and that's something that I really like but of course on the other side it's not as fun because you're not seeing your friends every day and we had less clinical exposure but luckily this is something that has changed just this month I have been going back into clinics and hopefully there'll be more of that in the next few months so I'm really looking forward to that so while I was in while I was in um at home you know waiting doing uni from 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 online this is where the Immersify app really came in and helped me I had known about it from first year but I started to use it more in second year and um, that's that's because it helped me get more of that clinical exposure and practice since I wasn't getting much of it from uni. So I'm going to start telling you a bit about the app now. If you've downloaded it, feel free to join along with the next few slides. But if you're if you haven't had a chance to yet, that's OK. You can go through that later. So first of all, um, when it comes to the app, there's three things that you can do you have lessons, quizzes, and practicals. And like they said before, you're able to customize your character, which is really fun. You have a lot of options to choose from and outfits and things like that. And you, this character will show up on leaderboards. So when you play games, you score points and then you can rank up in leaderboards. So that's something that's really fun. I'm going to be talking about each of these now. So first of all, lessons. So this is where we learn about tooth morphology. You have um, lessons talking about each tooth in detail. They're very easy to follow and they're very comprehensive and accurate. So we're looking at 
upper teeth and lower teeth. And you can even look at these in augmented reality. So basically, you can have the tooth appear like in your room, in your bedroom or something. Um, now, I want to point out, there's definitely no expectation for you to learn all the stuff before dental school, because you're not in dental school yet. So don't worry about that. But it just gives you a bit of an idea of the kind of things we have to learn. Because tooth morphology is something that's really important, especially in first and second year. And I'm going to show you an example of what the voiceover looks like now. Like the mandibular first molar, the mandibular second molar has two roots, one mesial and one distal. However, they are closer together and may curve more distally. So that's just an example of what the voiceover sounds like. Um, so this is really cool and it's really helpful when learning tooth morphology. And this is just to show you an example of what it would look like in augmented reality. So you can see how you can zoom in, you know, rotate the tooth, look at it fully. And it's honestly really cool. Okay, now let's move on to quizzes. So we have multiple choice questions. And this is something that's really good for testing your knowledge. And especially since multiple choice questions are really popular in dental school as well when it comes to exams. And as before, you, you can rotate the tooth, look at it. You have your options here. And if you get something right, you earn points on it. And like we said before, this leads up to your um, ranking. So yeah, it's just a really fun way to test yourself. Okay, so now we have practicals and we have a few of these. One of them is 3D dental anatomy, which is a bit similar to the one before, except you can look at them like this and it just gives you a chance to look at everything properly, you know, you can move them around and we also have baby teeth and adult teeth. Dental ID, this is one of my favorite games. So instead of giving you multiple choices, you have all the options and you have to decide which one's the right one. So for example, is it an upper tooth? Is it a lower tooth? Is it on the right? Is it on the left? And then which tooth it is as well. This one's a bit more challenging, um, but it's also more fun because it has a timer. And a last one, last practical is chartistry. So dental charting is something that dentists do when you go to see them for a checkup. So they'll look at your tooth and they'll count which teeth there are, which ones are missing. They'll also look at if you have any fillings, any caries and things like that. And there's specific symbols we use on the dental chart when it comes to this. So this is, I think, a re the most closest you can get to kind of like work experience, let's say, because it kind of gives you an idea of what you can do. And the thing I really like about it is that you can do it in real life. So it's as if the patient is with you and you can move your phone around and look into the mirror, which is really cool. And yeah, so here you can just practice looking around and here you can see some of the dental, what the dental chart looks like and how you would record everything. Yeah, so if you guys wanna um, play around with that, course feel free to and once again don't feel pressured to know everything you of course don't need to you're not dental students yet but just to give you a bit of an insight and lastly I want to tell you about a bit about the Immersify community so I became an ambassador for Immersify in first year and it's been really amazing so far it's given me a lot of opportunities so my role is to try out new features of the app before they're released and give feedback on what they're like, what I like about it, what needs a bit of improvement, things like that. And it's really fun because as you know, technology is evolving every day and Immersify is actually the first dental app that I know of that's really good and actually really helpful. So it's something that's really amazing. And I'm really happy to be part of the community and they'll be adding more features soon and practice tools to, to support the dental journey of students from years one to five. And this includes more practicals 
and more multiple choice questions. Um, so you never know, maybe when you guys get into dental school, maybe one of you would become an ambassador for Immersify as well. And so I wanted to keep it short because I know we've already overrun. I hope that that was helpful in some way, that you managed to gain something from it. If you guys want to message me um, about anything, you can message me on Instagram. My Instagram is Dental Diaries with an underscore. And also check out Immersify's Instagram as well. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation, Areep. Okay, we will now move on to our second live Q&A with our dental speakers. Again, Afi and I will be asking the questions that you've submitted onto our Instagram story. So, the first question is, how do we stand out in dental applications and interviews? Did I take that one, I think, Areep? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go on. Uh, then you can add your bit as a student perspective. Um, I think when I'm doing the admissions interviews, one of the things that I look for, because like I said already in my presentation, academic, we're all kind of on a platform. That's already been better. People have already looked at your application. And if you've got as far as the interview, it means academically, we know you're bright. We know you're clever. That's why you're coming to us. When you're in the interview itself, Communication is a massive thing in dentistry. You need to be putting across that personality, that big smile, that kind of confidence, that ability to hold your head up high and shoulders back and just basically give it to us, you know, because we have lots, lots of personality with that. Absolutely. Because if you're sitting there in your chair, kind of mumbling into yourself, into your chest, that's not filling me with confidence. I want to see people on clinic who I know I can say, right, Afia, I want you to go and do X, Y, and Z to that patient. I know that you can manage that. You know, so I know you've got to be, like you said, lead clinician, you're gonna be in charge of a team. So I think confidence and personality needs to shine through. And sometimes the extracurricular stuff you do might lend itself to showing that there are other aspects to your personality, not just academia. I can't emphasize that enough. Everybody will have done D of E, guys. Everybody's got a gold D of E. I hear it. When we were in, and I say, give an example of when, you know, you showed leadership. And everybody goes back to when they were camping in D of E. I've heard, I've heard it all, guys. I want to hear something fresh um, and different that really shows leadership, that really shows that actually you're bringing something new to the party. You know, so I actually think something more additional, extracurricular, as that's less box standard than every other application. Areej, what do you think? Um, I totally agree with you, especially when it comes to the confidence and communication. And similarly to your extracurriculars, I would say that if there's something you do that you think is not interesting at all and not relevant to dentistry, mention it because they're going to think it's amazing and they're really going to like it. For example, I did media studies as a third A level. Um, and in my personal statement, I literally, I literally wrote like one sentence about it. But in my interview at BOTS, they asked me so, so many questions about this because they wanted to know more about it. And, you know, I was able to link it to leadership um, and other skills that a dentist needs. So definitely if there's something that you think um, what is not relevant and they're going to not like it, um, don't think that because it's actually the unique things that make you stand out and it's the things that they're looking for because like Dr. Yunus said they've heard like everything um they've heard almost everything so anything new that you can bring is really amazing and be confident in yourself as well um thank you moving on to the next question uh, what is the one thing you wish you did differently when applying for med dental school? Sorry, med dental school. Um, I can answer this because there's actually something that I always think about when it comes to this. So I live in London and when I was applying, I was like, my mind was set. OK, well, I'm going to a London uni. Like, that's all I thought about. So because of that, I literally only looked into Kings and Bart's. 
and I didn't even bother like looking at other universities because my mind was so set in like staying on London but now I regret that because there's actually um the universities in the UK they're so amazing and there's so many things that um, makes each dental school so special that I didn't think about before. So if you're applying right now or you're thinking of applying, definitely research each dental school properly and, you know, look at the pros and cons of each. Think about would you like to live in this city, for example, um, and especially look at the things that they do differently. So don't just be narrow-minded, even if you have if you have your heart set on one dental school. Research all of them properly before you decide. Can I just add, I did the opposite of a reach. I was a northern lass, Manchester based, and I wanted to go as far as possible from home <laughs> and ended up down south in London, um, which was a scary experience because it was the first time away from home, but actually was one of the best things I did because it, and again, my mum was the one who pushed me to doing that and gave me the confidence to do it and said, no, you'll be fine. Even though I knew in my heart, I was so scared of doing that, living alone, looking after my own finances, leaving all, leaving all my friends behind because nobody was going to the same place I was going to. But definitely, I think it was the best decision my mum made for me. I'd just like to add at that point, as Asian parents often do. And I'm sure I'll do the same for my kids. But um, looking a, a further afield, think outside the box. But um, as far as the actual applying for dental school goes, I went for guys because it was I looked at the leaderboard at the time and it was the top in the leaderboard at the time. So that's why I went for that uni and I got in amazingly. So I was just didn't consider any others. So that's what my decision was based on. Yeah. OK, it's interesting to see those both sides then. Um, so for the next question, it is about what type of work experience would you recommend? So either during COVID or post? It would also be interesting to hear um, Areej what you actually did and how it helped you. Um, so when I was applying, I did like a whole range of different work experiences. So I did work experience in a GP, um, in a pharmacy and in a dental practice. And also I did volunteering at a hospital um, on, the work, on the wards. So it was different and um this wasn't just because this wasn't because i wanted to see like different careers as well because i was kind of certain that i wanted to do dentistry but it's because that you can you can gain so much skills and so much experience from every single type of work experience it doesn't just have to be in a dental practice because i know how difficult it is to get this right now especially with um agp so like aerosol ger generating procedures and i don't think any dental practices are really um allowing students to do work experience so if there's anything you can get even if it's like in a charity shop for example like working behind the counter I think that's really useful because you're gaining those communication skills you know you're talking with patient um, not patients sorry you're talking with customers who are um, different like you're going to see different customers every day for example and that's very similar to what dentists do because you see different patients every day and you have to know how to start a conversation with them so I would recommend anything that is going to help you with those communication skills, um, especially. And another thing that might be good, guys, is working care homes. Um, if I know that at COVID now at the moment it's not, but loads of our students who come through, if you don't deal with older patients or different members of the community, you don't actually challenge yourself and you're not challenging one the way you communicate and maybe how limited another person's communication skills might be you're not you're not actually experiencing that and the other thing is the empathy that you feel working with older people knowing what their needs are knowing how they used to be and perhaps how they are now um, things like these go down well in interviews um, we like to hear about that um, one of the things that I did when I was at sixth form a hundred years ago was that I was um, I worked in a special needs school and I guess that's where the interest for um, community dental service came in because I used to go, our, our sixth form had a scheme where every Wednesday, if you didn't do sports, you could go off and do some kind of community project. I'm sure a lot of schools still do things like that where they do placements. And I went along to a special needs school and worked with uh, younger patients, younger, um, younger uh, students who had, you know, limited 
uh, life expectancies and limited abilities. However, I mean, I got a spoon thrown in my head one day when I was there at sixth form, you know, came back with a big bruise on my head. Um, but it taught me something about myself. I reflected on it and realized that, you know, next time I shouldn't be in the line of fire. I should be on the other side of that uh, particular child when they've got sharp implements in their hand. You know, you will learn something. And again, it was something I shared at interview mm -hmm. about the challenges you face because it shows that in the face of adversity, you've, you have explored other things as well, because dentistry is not just sitting down and drilling and filling, you know, contrary to what a lot of people believe. There are many, many branches, and I hope that just looking at my career span, you know, it makes you the person you are, because you've experienced so many different aspects of dentistry. So definitely work experience is definitely not limited to being surgery side assistant or working at the front desk of a dental surgery, for sure you know, care homes, special needs schools, anywhere you're working with people, like Areej said, charity shop, anything where you're working in a community setting, great, grab it, you know. Brilliant. I think <laughs> both of you have given our students like a good little crib sheet of where they can try and find work experience. Um, we've had several questions um, asking about alternative routes um, into dentistry if they don't get the grades first time round. Um, Dr. Younes, do you want to tell us yeah. more about that? So, so each year we do have people who enter as mature students. That doesn't mean they come in with corduroys or anything. It just means that they've done a BSc beforehand, which means that perhaps they didn't make the grades to come in directly. So they might have done cellular biology. They may have done biomedical sciences. They might have done something else, sometimes even at QM itself. And then they make their way into the application process at BARTS, which actually, I love mature students. We call them mature, even though sometimes they're not as mature as we'd like to hope they are. But basically, they have a strong head on their shoulders. They've already experienced uni life. They've done all the silly things. They've been out partying all night. They've settled down. They know how to do that work-study balance. And they're a pleasure usually to teach because they have a good grasp of, of how to control the curriculum, how to know when they've got to knuckle down and do their studies. So actually, if you do do an alternative degree, something, sometimes there's even the chance of moving across before you do the full three years of your BSE, you might get the option of moving in year two, and it might allow you to cut off the first year of dentistry, you know, because a lot of us do intercalate. Uh, and same in medicine, as, as some of the doctors were mentioning, they did integrate in. So it just gives you an extra qualification. So it's not wasted, guys. You learn how to be a researcher as well if you're doing a BSc. So that's always a fantastic skill to have because it's something that we push more and more evidence-based dentistry is something we're looking for. So if you do go that route, then there is always the option that you might get first year and old, or even if you start again and you do the five years and you end up doing eight years, Every 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 day, every minute, everything you do is an opportunity. You have to make the most of it. So never feel it's wasted because it's taking you on your journey to where you want to be. And if dentistry is what you want to do and you want to take that long route, you do it. I thoroughly recommend it because I'm happy doing what I do every day. You know, I don't hate it. You know, I love it. And it, where I've needed to, I've made changes to adapt what type of dentistry I do. So I think that's, you know, definitely I would say. If you want to do a degree first and get in that way, or if you think you want to sit back, look at your A-level grades and think, I'm going to resit, that's going to be the best option for me, go through that again, then that's another option that's open to you. And don't feel that at it, that's going to bring you on a lower level than someone else, because actually, reflection, tell us why, why did you do those A-level grades? What went wrong the first time? What did you learn from that? How, what are you bringing to the table that's different to all the other little minions that are there at interview? What what are you bring, well, how are you shining out to me? What are you saying to me? You know what? Things didn't go well. This is what I did. And then I reflected on it and I realized that I did this, this, and this wrong. And so I went back to the drawing board. It shows that you've got strength of character, that there's something within you that's pushed you to say, no, I'm not giving up on my dream. You know what? I'm gonna just dust myself off stand up again and go for it. So that's, you know, again, something that's going to show you to be different from the crowd. Not that I'm recommending anyone fails their A-levels, parents. <laughs> Areej? Um, I think you explained it perfectly. Um, 
I do know that some universities have um, special programs. So for example, um, King's does a enhanced support program. Um, I believe if you go to a state school, they can give you like um, an offer with lower requirements. So that's one option. And also Bristol, I believe also has something similar to that where you can get an offer with lower grades. Um, but other than that, I would say that Dr. Eunice explained it perfectly. And it's so true when it comes to um, postgraduate graduate students. I look up to them a lot. Um, I always go to the postgrads in my year and ask them for advice and stuff because they're really knowledgeable and they've been through it. So yeah, don't think that you're gonna be lock looked down upon or something like that, because it's not true. Okay, great. So I feel like the overall message is don't be disheartened. There's always way to spin things and make it work for you, I guess. Um, so moving on to our final question, um, unfortunately, it does have to be our final one because we are running out of time. But um, I think both Dr. Eunice and Arij have shared their contact details. So if you want to ask them anything specifically, uh, feel free to do so, or you can email Samda. So our final question is, um, what are the rewarding aspects of being a dentist and a dental student? Who wants to go first? Arij? You can go first. <laughs> I, can I go first? Yeah. Well, like I said, I love being a dentist. Um, and I've done so many different, I've been a dentist of sorts so many years over the 20 plus year career span that I've had. I kind of feel as if I've tasted different aspects of it. And in each role that I did, there were different things that shone out to me, whether it be being able to afford a Gucci handbag or whether it be, you know, getting that child out of pain in that difficult scenario. They're all plus points of being a dentist. But I think the one thing that I think that is the major thing is when somebody walks into you and they're nervous, and most of us are nervous. When I'm in the dental chair, I promise you I'm nervous. I'm a difficult patient. But because I know what's going to happen, I guess the, you know, the knowledge, you know, doesn't give me confidence. It makes me wonder what that dentist is doing. But any patient who comes into you, usually you're on the back foot. So you have to, through your communication skills, through your empathy that you show, through the way your body language, the tone of your voice that you have, you know, and I have this peds nod and smile that, that we, we teach you how to do, you know, and gain that rapport with your patient to the point where they feel comfortable and confident in opening their mouth to you and sharing what the problem is. And then for you to try and work a way together with your patient, come up with a plan that suits them, suits you, suits their purse, you know, their budget as well. And that is realistic and works for that patient. And I think that five minute window of opportunity that you've got where you lead your patient from the waiting room into the chair and you're having that non-dental chat, you know, a little bit of banter about the weather or the cat or whatever it is, and then gaining their confidence in order to be able to help them in some way, shape or form. I think that's a really great aspect about being a dentist and changing their life somewhere. somewhere sometimes people don't smile they're shy about their teeth, you know, they don't want to show it. To, and building up that broken tooth might be the, you know, something that you've done in 20 minutes in the surgery. But it's life changing for that child that you've done, you know, or for those parents, you know, they might have been being bullied for it. So I think we do great things, you know, we are superheroes in our own way, you know, all of us in whatever we do. So definitely, um, I think that's a very, very rewarding aspect. Um, for me as a dental student, I would say something that I really love is being surrounded by like-minded people and just generally like really amazing people. Um, because like every, because like I feel like you have to do so many things to get to this point. Um, you're surrounded by people who have done so much and you can learn so, so much from them. So like there's people starting businesses, there's like artists and just like so many amazing people. and being surrounded in that kind of environment um, kind of makes you want to be the best version of yourself. So I think that's something that's really amazing. And not just dental students, because we're on campus with medical students as well, you can also meet amazing people over there as well. So I think the community part of it, and especially I feel like Bart has such a strong community feel to it and like a family vibe. So I've met a lot of older students as well who are really amazing. 
And yeah, that's something that I really love about being a dental student. Um, Mother, I think you're muted. Yeah, didn't um, just realise. Um, but I think that was a really nice positive note to end on. We want to we want to encourage people to go into dentistry. As you um, said, Dr. Eunice, everyone's a superhero in their own right. And it's about um, achieving, uh, realising that potential. And OK, so we will end the Q&A there. Thank you both of you for your time and expertise. We will now move. On. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll now move on to concluding today's morning live stream. So we would like to give a huge thank you to all of our speakers for their amazing and inspiring talks. We would also like to thank and acknowledge the hard work that our collaboration societies from Barts and London put in to bring this event to you. And of course, thank you to all of you for attending. We hope you enjoyed yourselves and gained useful insight into medicine and dentistry. I'd like to hand over to Dr. Robson, our staff president, to share some final words of wisdom with you all. Thank you. And thank you to Afia and Rafura for, for putting this um, morning together. I, I really hope you have found something useful out of the talks that you've heard. I hope you found out that and, and understand that you can you can do lots of things that will count as work experience. What we really want you to get out of work experience is to think outside the box and to think what you can do, even if it's just talking to your next door neighbor and getting them through this pandemic. That is still valid and is still a useful contribution because you're practicing your communication skills. You're practicing that empathy and, and getting to getting to know how to interact with different patients of different ages and it's all valid if you can work in a shop even in a charity shop or do any other volunteering that is still valid what we want to see when you look at the application is for something to stand out you've heard from dr eunice about how how you can actually stand out at interview. And it is about not just saying on your Duke of Edinburgh that somebody tripped over and sprained their ankle or that you got lost and you led them out of, out of that situation because we have heard it before. We're actually more interested in, you were working in the shop and somebody was buying all these toilet rolls and, and during the early days of the pandemic. And how did you deal with that situation? How did you go up to them and actually diffuse that situation between two individual shoppers, if that was something that you've experienced? That's what we want to see. Um, for dentistry, it's about dexterity. So, I mean, I've not recently, but I have sat in on some dental um, interviews and it is about dexterity it's about you know even your hobbies you can bring in so if you into crochet or knitting or sewing that is still valid and we want to hear about those experiences it's about we want to know something about you when i go into medical interviews what i want is not to have somebody who's academically brilliant because you've already passed that hurdle what i want is for that patient uh, that person sat on the other side of the table to fill me with confidence that potentially in five six years time that they could actually be my doctor and i'd be quite happy for that individual to treat myself or a member of my family so we want to, you to have a bit of a personality if you're into sports brilliant if you're not into sports but you're into music or you're into arts brilliant but we want to know something about you you can come from different backgrounds and that's what we want because your patients are coming from different backgrounds and we want you as future medical or dental professionals to reflect the population that you come from from your community so that you bring all those skills if you so I would encourage everybody to think about applying for medicine or dentistry and there is overlap you can actually switch from one to the other we haven't heard about that but if you're a, if you've done dentistry you can switch to doing um, medicine you can go the other way um, there are alternative routes into medicine as well um, if don't 
if if you if something happens and life happens don't be discouraged find another route if this is what you want to do then do it um, because there's no more rewarding uh, profession or career than um, going into medicine you never know what's going to walk through the door patients always surprise you whichever field they you come into so if this is something that you want to do do it Sandra are here to help ask them questions ask me questions ask the other um, people that have spoken today questions get to know what the profession is what it's about and put your application in and we'll support you through that um for the brilliant conclusion um now on to something everyone has been eagerly waiting for the certificates if you scan the qr code or alternatively type out the boxed link you will be taken to a feedback form and once you submit it you will be able to access your certificate of attendance and the SAMDA application guide, as well as a mailing list for our future events so you never miss out. And the feedback form will close at 10 p.m. tonight, so that means you'll only be issued certificates until then. And our social media and email are on the screen. Um, do subscribe to our YouTube channel, and as this is just the first event of the year, and we have so much more planned for the summer. Uh, we hope you all stay safe and good luck with your exams. Until next time, goodbye.